Given the unprecedented circumstances of the pandemic, Governor Baker did seek relief from provisions of the open meeting law, which allow us to conduct this meeting using a collaborative uh, remote technology. So thank you. Should we have any trouble in this, with this connection to those who are attending, uh, particularly to the public, please visit our website. We will give instructions at massgaming.com. Bringing this meeting to order. <clears throat> this is uh, Massachusetts Gaming Commission's 304th public meeting. It is Thursday, June 4th, here in the Commonwealth, starting at 10 a.m. Thank you, and I will make sure that we, this, I, I wanna make sure that I'm recording as well. One minute. Uh, it is saying on my screen that it is recording, Kathy. Thank you. Great. So we will get we'll get started just so the public knows this meeting it is being recorded. Before we start with the business of the day, I have just a statement that I'd like to make. We maintain our deep gratitude, of course, for all the medical personnel, frontline workers and our first responders who continue to selflessly guide us through the pandemic. As we know, however, our resiliency continues to be tested in ways that previously unimaginable and our hearts are broken for all who are suffering loss, indignity, and great pain. The recent confluence of traumatic events has laid bare the painful reality of our nation's racial and ethnic disparity COVID-19 has taken more than 100,000 lives in the United States, impacting communities of color at an astonishingly disproportionate rate. We are all mourning the tragic and senseless death of George Floyd, united against inequality and injustice. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. As leaders, we are compelled to stand up speak out, and most importantly, proactively create the change we desperately need. At MGC, we have dedicated much because of the thoughtful work, thoughtful work of the legislature, our work to creating a diverse and equitable gaming industry. Our licensees share that value and commitment, but there's a lot more meaningful work to be done and that we will do. We continue to take the actionable steps necessary to advance diversity and promote equality. I commend all those who have engaged in peaceful demonstration, courageously making your voices heard and your hurt known. We're also grateful to those in the law enforcement community, many of whom are members of our MGC team, our gaming enforcement unit, for protecting and upholding our right to demonstrate peacefully. With that, we move on to our business of the day with a renewed sense of commitment to listen, learn, and support each other. Thank you, and we'll get started. Commissioner Stebbins with the minutes. Thank you, good morning, Madam Chair, my colleagues. Um, in your packet, you have the minutes from the May 14th, 2020 commission meeting. I would move their approval subject to any changes for uh, grammatical errors or any other immaterial changes. I have a second. Second. If I could, I just had one edit I wanted to, um, or clarification I wanted to ask for. Um, I had made a point of commenting at the hearing on the 14th about the theme of conflict of interest, both identifying and then establishing protocols to prevent the consequences of conflict of interest. And I didn't see it in the minutes. I would just ask, um, Shara, if you could go back through and just insert. Um, uh, a Commissioner reference Brian, to that. Commissioner Brown, can you guess where it might be based on the uh, the time? Frame? I think it was after my first question. Um, I think it was later. Uh, I think I make a comment around 2.34. I think it was after that is my memory. Right. I know that there was, I, I think I followed up on the conflicts. In any case, uh, I'm sure, Shari, you'll be able to find it. I will. Great. Thank you. Thank you. 
should we wait or should we proceed with I think it's I think it's fine it's if to just insert it at the appropriate spot but otherwise I'm, I'm fine to move on it today okay commissioner any other edits or uh, qualifications comments I see no I thought they were excellent Shara um, thank you for making that one amendment comprehensive uh, I will do a real call vote Commissioner Cameron aye Commissioner O'Brien aye Commissioner Zuniga aye and Commissioner Stebbins aye and I vote yes so five zero thanks Shara Mr. Stebbins? Sure, the next set of minutes we have in your packet is from the May 21st, 2020 meeting. Uh, I'd move their approval, again, subject to any changes for grammatical errors or any other material changes. Second. Thank you. Any questions, comments, edits on this? Again, excellent, Shara, thank you. I'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zunica? Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. Chair votes yes. Thank you. 5 0. Chair, Chair Judge Stein, can I, uh, can I also make a statement like you just did? Uh, oh, absolutely. I was going to um, invite uh, at the end, but I think it makes sense now. Commissioner Zunica, I'll let you go first and welcome any all comments. It's an important time for us to share our thoughts. Yeah, no, I uh, I think the the most important thing is to acknowledging to acknowledge what's happening uh, around us, like like you just did. But I didn't I didn't want to add my voice to that. Uh, uh, what we're witnessing is clearly unprecedented and uh, quite possibly an inflection point, uh, like it's been said um, in the media, uh, which, which I think uh, ultimately will be positive. Um, the the, sec the second thing is that uh, it's it's no longer um, uh, acceptable to be just standing by and, and, and remaining silent and, and hence, you know, I just wanted to add my voice to, to this. And, um, and you said, well, all the principles that we stand by, um, I do want to just uh, mention, as we begin the opening of the, of the casinos, uh, I think it's at least conceivable that, uh, you know, our, our employees are going to be dealing with uh, with at least some people who might be a little angrier uh, than before, and that's why it's uh, it's very important to remember that uh, it is better uh, and usually much much better to uh, diffuse a situation, um, de-escalate, like I know uh, our people uh, often do and, and 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 stand by, and that in most cases when it comes to interactions. At the casinos, um, those situations result in just somebody needing to go home, and I think that will that will continue. Um, but but one of the one of the takeaways for me from um, from uh, the the seeing the video of Mr. Floyd is how important it is to react with uh, proportionality, uh, something that uh, that is always present in the good people, excellent people that we have in the GEU. Um, I think that recent events uh, should be a very strong reminder of, of why it's important to always adhere uh, to the principles of mutual respect and the values like uh, understanding. So um, I would just uh, end by saying that uh, one of the, and tie it to, to the recent report of our independent monitor, um, Miller and Chevalier, uh, and although there's not exactly a lot of parallels, um, I think uh, a big takeaway for me was when it comes to culture, maintaining culture, I'm not saying we need to create a new culture. Culture. Everyone has a role um, and it also needs to be communicated often. Hence, uh, hence this, this idea that I introduced that important to um, remember, acknowledge, and communicate um, that everyone has a role in, in upholding those principles. Absolutely. If um, another commissioner would like to speak now or at the end of the meeting, I invite you at this time. Okay. We'll, we'll hold on that, those good, good thoughts. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Zuniga. <clears throat> 
I think now then we will move on to item number three on our agenda. We're going to hear from a special guest right up front, uh, uh, <clears throat> starting on with Workforce Supply and Diversity Development, Bill Griffin, if you could introduce our special guest today. I know that Jill, you're on, but maybe you're not. Are you still mute? Okay, that was a test. There we go. <laughs> and you. I can see your face too, Jill. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. Thank you, everybody. Um, I am uh, joined by the executive director of the Massachusetts Cultural Council, Anita Walker. And um, uh, just by way of background, um, the Massachusetts Cultural Council receive, receives um, funds from the casinos. Um, uh, the expanded gaming law created, uh, as you know, 25% tax on gross gaming revenue and 2% of the revenues flow to the Massachusetts Cultural Council. Um, one quarter of the revenues is dedicated to the organization um, and um, three quarters is dedicated to uh, mitigating the effects of um, the casinos on uh, performing arts centers. So she's um, here, Director Walker is here to give us an update on um, the uh, two programs that result from these funds. So I'm at this point going to turn it over to Director Walker and um, and I will also um, share her documents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. And thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about what we're doing at the Mass Cultural Council. And may I also echo the sentiment? You know what, uh, uh, Director Walker, we're having trouble hearing you. So let me just, let's just start over and figure out what the technology fix is. I also don't see her. Do you, does that, do other people see her? Yes. I had seen, um, Anita, I'd seen you earlier on and now I am not seeing you. Um, so can you hear me? And I can't hear you either. Can, I don't know if there's a volume issue from your, it shouldn't work that way, but. Hmm, interesting. She certainly was showing up. Is, uh, Commissioner Cameron, do you see Ms. Walker? I do not. It, okay. it says I am oh. viewing Jill Griffin's screen. So I, let me see if I can yeah. change the setting. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I don't either. You don't either. I see. Oh, Enrique does see her. Okay. I see, I see well, her. That's well. interesting. Now I'm going to put it on speaker view and I, um, Director Walker, could, if you could just start speaking, I can see if you should pop up as my speaker. Okay, can you hear me? Me now. I can barely hear you. Um, I can, my volume's up on my laptop. I can speak louder. Is this there, we are. there we are. You're popping up for me now. Um, maybe it is where your mic, where your, uh, Facing your, are you facing your microphone? Perhaps getting closer to the computer. Uh, Commissioner Zuniga had the same idea I did. If maybe you could speak a little bit more directly into your computer. Is All right. Help? Is this helpful? I'm speaking um, loudly into the computer now. Yeah, that's that is definitely. We can now hear you a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah. Now I can. Now I have you. Does everybody else? Is everybody all set? Yes. Okay. Good. All right. There we go. <laughs> Again, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk about the work at the Mass Cultural Council, uh, particularly with the uh, much appreciated funding that we are receiving um, from um, the casino uh, tax revenue. And just to uh, reiterate, um, this program really was built into the original legislation that legalized casino gambling in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the, the purpose is to compensate for the marketplace disruption that casinos bring in competing with our nonprofit presenting organizations uh, for nationally touring artists. Uh, we receive again 2% of the tax revenue, one quarter of which 
which uh, goes to our organizations in general that we support at the Mass Cultural Council, and three quarters to the uh, performing arts organizations that are in direct competition with the casino. Um, we have been long waiting for this funding, first for the casinos to get open and operating, and then there was some technical problems with the language, which was finally resolved last winter. And so the money finally became available to us at the first of this year. Um, we were poised our first round of grant making when um, COVID hit and everything shut down. So we did delay our deadlines for applications to this program uh, to give our organizations who were um, coping with this unprecedented uh, crisis as we all were, um, so that they, we could make sure that we were accessible to all of our organizations. So we designed this program in collaboration with uh, the organizations in the field. We held surveys, we had focus groups all across the Commonwealth. Uh, we had a design team that was made up of uh, members of the presenting uh, arts organizations. Um, and um, we have finally just in the last week or so uh, made our first round of grants uh, to mitigate uh, the impact of a, a casino gambling. As of February 29th, there was $4.7 million in the fund available to us. And so uh, we were able to utilize $3.34 million of that fund, that's three quarters of the fund, um, for our organizations that are presenting organizations in competition with uh, the casinos. Um, in our application process, um, not only were we seeking eligibility requirements, but we also wanted to know um, what impact our organizations had felt so far um, from the casinos once they opened. Uh, they were reporting increased artist fees of 25, 50%, even double what they had been used to paying in past years. Uh, some organizations found that as many as half of their bookings were in direct competition with casinos. Uh, one venue in particular uh, reportedly lost uh, $240,000 because they were unable to book um, an artist uh, just for two shows because it uh, went to the casino instead. So this funding um, already has proven to be incredibly important in terms of leveling the playing field and making more funds available to our organizations so that they can compete. Um, so we rolled out our first round of grants. 51 grants were made, uh, ranging in size from $1,000 to $250,000. Uh, we have a funding list that I believe is gonna be on your website. We just made the grant, so um, uh, I, worked with Jill and uh, she indicated that they were going to be uh, on your website. So you could take a look at the 51 organizations. They range uh, from small organizations all the way up to the Box Center in Boston, which by the way, um, I should say that you can't escape the environment that we're in. And COVID has been devastating to our field as all of our organizations are closed. Um, they've been experiencing layoffs. They've had to cancel performances. Uh, they are in a very, Hole financially uh, because of COVID. And then they were also at the same time struggling with the competitive effect of the casinos. So this money was incredibly well appreciated. And as it turns out, it couldn't have come at a, a, a more important time and a more crucial time for our organizations. Um, We've done some surveying in terms of the uh, impact of COVID on our organizations. Um, we do a dipstick tests every uh, few months or so. And the most recent one, April 22nd, found that our organizations collectively had lost, as of that date, a quarter of a billion dollars in income. 15,000 jobs have been affected. And um, now I want to turn to the one quarter um, of the funding, one quarter of the fund that uh, we are responsible for investing. We had initially planned a major initiative, which I'll talk about in a minute, but we felt that um, since this was really focused on the sustainability of our organizations, we were in emergency, uh, we decided to immediately redeploy this funds get it out to our field as quickly as possible and uh, make the highest and best use of it to help sustain our organizations um, at large in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So we created an emergency fund of close to a million dollars of the one quarter of the uh, gaming money. Again, I cannot tell you how critical these funds were. There were two parts of our program. We called the program Safe Harbors. 
Um, $753,000 of the fund was used for direct grants to our organizations, and about $240,000 was for incredibly necessary and important technical assistance. The technical assistance, we called it basically a, a technical assistance assault on the field. Everybody was closed, everybody was paralyzed, nobody knew what to do. We didn't have enough money uh, in our coffers at this late date of the year to refill the holes that they were already sinking in. Uh, and we knew that the highest and best chance that they had for some sort of stability was going to be coming out of the federal government. And the um, the SBA CARES Act program was highly competitive, but it was available to nonprofits. So in the first week of the COVID emergency, we were able to provide um, technical assistance through the Nonprofit Finance Fund to 1,600 participants, again, using casino funding um, to pay for this consultative services. And we had, we don't have final numbers yet. We had many, many organizations who were, not able, who were then able to apply for CARES Act funding, and many, many of them were successful in entering that program. We also provided training on cash flow planning, um, how to test various scenarios and work in their way through the COVID crisis, and how to make decisions on which of those scenarios might be best. And we've also done dozens and dozens of small group and one-on-one -on -one consultations with our organizations um, in order to cope with the COVID crisis. In addition, we provided 335 grants of $2,250. Um, these were just little lifelines to the field. Um, as they were scrambling to find every nickel and dime they could to stabilize their organizations since all revenue, earned income, contributed income, uh, had really um, um, been left behind. So um, again, I cannot tell you, uh, this was certainly not the intent of the casino funding. It was intended to um, be a mitigation around the casino issue and also to help our organizations thrive um, it's been a lifeline. It literally has been a lifesaver for our organization. Um, but we have not a, abandoned our original intention for the one quarter piece of the funding uh, because we were thinking that we really needed to um, lean into a new, use this fund for a, a new and discreet purpose that might in the long run not only enhance uh, one of what we think is the superpowers of the arts and culture in Massachusetts, but provide an, a new way of, a new funding stream for our organizations beyond the typical earned income and uh, contributed income. Income. And with that, um, two weeks before COVID, we launched a program called Culture RX. And this really focuses on um, the well documented protective factor um, that health and arts participation provides um, for well being and, and for healthy living. Um, we made a partnership with the Health Connector, the first ever in the country so that people who have uh, the subsidized insurance can use their insurance card to access nearly 200 nonprofit cultural organizations in the Commonwealth. And we were also building the very first social prescribing model so that um, doctors, uh, social workers, um, uh, guidance counselors, mental health professionals could literally write a prescription for arts participation and we would reimburse that cost of the services provided by our cultural organizations using the funds we were receiving from the casinos. We had four pilots up and running, very successful. And we were on the brink of announcing uh, the full scale um, social prescribing uh, initiative when of course COVID hit and everything was closed and there was no place to prescribe people to go. We don't want to let this, um, we, don't, we didn't want to put a stop on it. We didn't even really want to put a pause in this program. So we have set aside $120,000 of the gaming money so that we can keep slow, keep that program alive. Uh, because we know that the very epidemic that we had before COVID was um, loneliness and isolation, which leads to depression and mental health issues. Well, that is now uh, the way we fight COVID by isolating people and keeping them in their homes alone. And the consequences of that on the other side of COVID um, is going to be manifest again through mental health issues and, and, the, and the consequences of isolation and loneliness. We can already see it in our youth programs, uh, young people who have left uh, the homes that have been the source of their trauma to be part of our creative youth development programs are now sequestered in those very homes. And so we want to make sure that the, the Culture RX initiative is poised to come back to life as soon as we get through our slowly on the other side of the COVID crisis. And this funding will be again um, of 
incredible importance to our work at the Mass Cultural Council. I've told you a lot. I hope you could hear it, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. You were loud and clear, uh, Director Walker. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with just my observation. I know that you had to pivot here, and I was fortunate enough to have a chance to meet with you in advance of the pandemic crisis, and was particularly impressed by the possibility of the uh, social prescription uh, program that I understand you had to put on hold. What I like best is that you're, you're using uh, the casino funding to address well-being that um, is sometimes jeopardized, well, is jeopardized with isolation. And just as at some point, I would love to have uh, the organization revisit us because I do think there's an opportunity as we discussed for perhaps our game sense advisors to serve as, as social prescribers for um, as part of the outreach. So I don't know if you've met with um, our director of responsible gaming yet, um, Mark Vendelin, but I'm oh, sorry, and we have a barking dog, um, but um, we, would, uh, uh, we would look forward to an opportunity when it's right to, to work with the culture center on that. Thank you. And we did reach out. I think we were poised for a meeting when everything just completely yeah. shut down. Uh, it's it's such a great disappointment. And it's it's hard to, to um, there's so many things that are um, um, in our environment now that are making life difficult on, on every level of you alluded to it at the beginning. Ah. I really feel strongly that um, the Cultural X initiative is more important now than ever before. And it is a priority of the Mass Cultural Council. Other questions, uh, fellow commissioners, I, I normally don't go first, but I, I was hoping to avoid the barking dog situation. So thank you. Um, <laughs> sure, Stevens, do you have a barking dog behind you? <laughs> no, no, he, for some reason he knew to walk out of the room at 10 o'clock, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, no, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Walker, nice to see you. Um, thanks for your continued good work. And, and I know you uh, expressed a lot of patience waiting for the money to arrive. And I'm anxious to, to see the awards that you've made and hopefully give all of us a better understanding of really the, the competing pressures that your organizations are under with respect to their relationships with traveling entertainment and our casinos. Um, uh, just, just a, a thought or a question I'd like to come back to. Um, you know, love to, you know, I think there's certainly a, 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 a strong mutual relationship that can be formed between your performance uh, organization members and our casinos, especially as we come out of this COVID crisis and everybody is looking to get back out and do things with their family or go to a resort and uh, maybe not having a lot of international travelers come in, but more local tourism uh, driving the market and looking for those opportunities where our casino licensees can partner with the Mass Cultural Council and your many members would be a uh, would be a great opportunity for a strategy session at some point. Um, I completely agree, and um, even in advance of. Um, um, life returning to whatever normal is going to look like in the future, it occurs to me that our organizations truly are struggling with um, whatever best practices may be available, especially for assembling people in venues, uh, our theaters, our larger venues. I expect that casinos are also uh, taking a look at best practices there as well, whether it's timed admissions, whether it's reduced occupancy. Um, this is all sort of uncharted territory for us, and we are really seeking expertise. And if that expertise is available in the casino organizations, if they have access to um, information, consultation, um, I think we're all, in a sense, sort of operating in a similar space that we've never had to contend with before. What's the business model when you're not able to have as many people, um, uh, but the shows cost the same? Uh, why can't we share some of that information and work together on finding those best practices? I think that's a great idea. I think that's uh, perhaps a, a great starting point to, to build the relationships between our licensees and, and the many cultural organizations across the Commonwealth. I think that's a great suggestion. We should follow up on that. Thank you, Madam Chair.
Other questions for Director Walker? Commissioners? All right. Well, not just, just to say that uh, I look forward to, um, to another update on the different circumstances. Uh, however, those, um, you know, however that new normal is, uh, I think uh, we're in a very unique situation and, and there's very similarities, as you suggest, um, uh, with, with the casinos having unable, being unable to conduct large gatherings. Uh, but as, as, as things return to some kind of normalcy, we'd love to have you back and give us another update. I, I think, if I'm correct, and Director Walker, I don't know if your plans have changed, but we may not be seeing you come back. It may be a reporting from a successor or members of your current team. Um, it has been announced that you do plan to retire and go back to California where you and I talked. We both have our children there. Um, so when is that date? Actually, um 26 days, but who's counting? Uh, and I want you to know, um, I, I did announce my retirement two weeks before COVID because everything was in perfect shape. We were on a, we had a great budget. We were on a path to a nice increase this year. Our organizations were strong. The agency is strong and continues to be. Um, and so I figured that was a great time to head west to spend more time with my adult children. And of course, two weeks later, you know what happened. But no, my, I bought a house in California and um, my my last day is June 30th, but you have a strong partner at the Mass Cultural Council, and I assure you that uh, that will continue. Thank you. Well, we wish you well, thank and you. we thank, thank you for laying the foundation. Um, we're so pleased that the legislature thought to make sure that some of these funds travel to this effort. Thank you. On behalf of all, all my fellow commissioners, we wish you well, and, and thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Jill. Uh, we, we navigated the technical challenges. Again, much to because of the success laid by our great IT team. So we're moving now um, to item number four, our administrative update from Interim Executive Director, Karen Wells. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. Uh, as an initial matter, uh, again, I would like to thank our staff who have all been just working so diligently during the tr most trying of times and I'm so grateful for all their efforts and their, and their great work product. Uh, just as a few updates, uh, we continue to work on the guidelines for casino reopening. Uh, we are expecting to have a public discussion uh, on that on next Thursday, June 11th. Uh, so I expect that there'll be a public meeting notice put out on that. Um, also, uh, want to recognize the pandemic has uh, had an impact on not our, only on employees at the casinos, but also on casino vendors. So our Director of Workforce Supplier and Diversity Development, Jill Griffin, who you just heard from earlier, has been working on not only identifying resources for local vendors, but also working on understanding that impact and what's going on. And I just wanted to give Jill a minute uh, or two to just to uh, just highlight some of those efforts and what she's seeing for the Commission. Thank you. Um, as um, Chair Judd Stein, uh, Stein opened the meeting, um, she mentioned that our licensees really have been focused on providing opportunities to vendors throughout the Commonwealth, but um, with a particular focus on ensuring that minority women and veteran businesses um, have access to these opportunities to provide goods and services. Um, the shutdown, um, both the, of the general economy and of the casinos has had a significant impact um, especially on the small business community. Um, we've been in touch with many of these vendors. Um, and what, what I have seen is that um, many of the small um, businesses, especially those who have grown rapidly due to the casino business, um, have been particularly hard hit. Um, there are others, um, who had a uh, more diverse uh, business mix, um, who are, you know, of course are still struggling, um, but maybe have been able to pivot
for example, a, a WMBE that I talked to yesterday is um, now selling um, face masks and hand sanitizer. Um, but she um, she mentioned that you know these are tough times. Um, so we have um, the Commission's Office of Workforce Supplier and Diversity has responded um, by offering resources. Um, we've engaged two business uh, advisory firms to provide technical assistance. Um, we have provided up-to-date information on all the resources throughout the Commonwealth on our website. And we have also provided a series of webinars. On March 18th, we had Ken Messina from the Mass Hire Department of Career Services Rapid Response Team. And um, he provided options for businesses experiencing downturn um, and um, gave them options in terms of furloughs, the work share uh, program as alternatives to layoffs, as well as highlighting uh, the department's reemployment services. Um, on April 14th, um, Amin Benali from LEAF, the Local Enterprise Assistance Fund, discussed strategies utilized by businesses um, during previous downturns to manage liquidity and balance sheets. Um, and then um, later on in the month of April, we actually brought in the U.S. Small Business Administration District Director Robert Nelson and his um, deputy Nadine Boone, um, both from the Massachusetts District Office, and they gave us really up-to-date information not only on the PPP program um, and other CARES Act um, funding, but also other bridge loans and debt relief that businesses can take advantage of. So um, we continue to reach out um, and, um, and work with businesses to provide information um, and, and talk with licensees about particular situations. So thank you. Thank you. Questions, I, I know it's part of, uh, from Executive Director Wells, the administrative update, but for, for Jill now, all commissioners, do you have questions on this particular initiative? Bruce, did you want to come? No, just to, just to say I've had a chance to be on some of those calls that Jill has had and just uh, offering kudos to she and, and Crystal Howard for the good work that they've been doing. Excellent, excellent outreach and, and so critical. Um, and I'm gathering that you're getting a good attendance. Good. Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Karen, do you wish to continue? Yeah. So as to uh, item 4A on the agenda, the MGC office space update, I wanted to let you know that the team has been working with Commissioners Cameron and Stebbins on our internal office reopening. Governor Baker implemented a four-stage plan to reopen Massachusetts. And under the governor's current plan, work then can be done remotely, uh, should be continued to be done so until phase four. Uh, and also the casinos and horse racing tracks are currently identified to allow reopening in phase three. Because of this framework, our internal reopening plan is to focus on the office space at the casinos and the racetrack first, as that space will presumptively need to be utilized in phase three, while the Boston space for the most part, will not need to be utilized until later. Our remote working capabilities have been extremely successful, so we will comply with the governor's directive to keep doing so. Currently, only the state police is in the Boston office, and they have received the required training from the state police on appropriate safety measures. So we're looking to the governor's advisory committee guidance, as well as state and federal health official guidance as a roadmap to what needs to be done before employees can go back to either the casinos or the Boston office. Derek, Loretta, and Tripti have been participating in working groups with HRT on the statewide plans for office reopening and the safety related protocols and HR issues. So I'd like to thank HRD for including us in, in those meetings. They've been extremely helpful. We're very grateful for that. 
Uh, the process is extremely complicated. It's unprecedented. And so I'd like to thank Loretta, uh, Derek, and Trupti uh, for all their work they have put into these groups and the, and the feedback they've given back to us on our behalf. So just want to update you on the casino office space. Gaming agents will need to be on site to get the casinos ready for opening. And then once the casinos opening are do open, racing employees will also need to be on site to prepare for the opening of racing in phase three. And we also recognize the game sense advisors our advisors are expected to be on property as well. Uh, GEU officers have already been, they have been on site all along and they will continue to be there. So prior to uh, staff going back uh, to the site, so the gaming agents, the racing employees, and uh, the uh, game sense advisors, uh, there are a number of things that need to happen. Uh, so some examples are notice to the employees about returning. That's very important so that employees have an opportunity to respond to the uh, return to work if they have any health concerns, uh, safety concerns, any HR concerns that they can talk to their supervisors or, or HR. Uh, we are very uh, employee focused here and we want to know from employees if they have any anxiety or concerns because we'll work with people to find solutions. Uh, we also need to secure necessary supplies such as cleaning agents, hand sign sanitizer, masks, and other uh, PPE. We also have to prepare the work site. For example, do, uh, office configurations need to be changed. What do we do for break rooms and shared things such as refrigerators and coffee makers? We also need to address social distancing in the office space. Uh, we have to have sanitization protocols for such things as copiers, scanners, shared computers. We have to identify and implement uh, putting up the appropriate signage. So there's appropriate messaging and reminders, which is helpful to keep people safe. And then we also have to have training for employees on the protocols and what they need to do to comply with the safety measures so that everyone is safe. So before going back to a work location, each employee will need to do um, to complete training on what those protocols are. And our goal is to have that training for MGC employees identified within the next 10 days. As for the Boston office, uh, currently, as I've stated, our Boston office functions have been working remotely and are expected to do so for the time being. Uh, so we're, we don't know the exact time frame of phase three, uh, but in order to comply with the directive and to minimize the risk of the state police officers that are working at the Boston office, that space will generally remain closed at this time. And as such, telework will continue. Uh, once restrictions are lifted, we will be ro rolling out further planning. I get that uh, people have anxieties about public transportation, about going back to work, uh, about how they're going to get there and what's going to happen. So we are going to work with people and talk to them about that. And, but I also recognize people miss being in the office, that they miss seeing their colleagues and they'd like to uh, be back with other people. Um, you know, as Anita mentioned, this, this distancing does have a psychological impact. So we, we do need to recognize that. But we'll be looking at possible additional measures that may help with a safer uh, incremental uh, rollout, including staggered work times, looking at configuration of the office space, if we think about specific days or weeks that individuals will come in so that uh, we're not having uh, the full capacity at the office at the same time. So any measures that we're going to do would be laid on top of any kind of state requirements that apply to all state agencies, as well as other businesses across the state. Uh, the other thing we're doing is we're in contact with the building. Uh, Joe Delaney has been very helpful with that to coordinate on their safety protocols. So as we are in an office building not that's not just owned by the state we have to work in partnership with that building uh, the other thing is we're we're expecting some good information gained from opening the casino space that we'll be able to use to help with the process of opening the boston space we're all uh, identifying lessons learned and best practices so we'll this will be an uh, evolving process and we'll be learning from what uh, is going on not only across the state but across the country um, so I don't know if Derek or Tripti have any comments. I'll allow them to jump in if they have, have anything they think I may have missed. Um, Derek or Tripti, any comments at this time? No, I think you've covered everything. Okay. Yeah, you've got everything. Okay. Uh, so I'd also, you know, like to uh, give an opportunity for Commissioner Cameron and or Commissioner Stebbins to say anything as they've been uh, very helpful with the group in making sure that, you know, we are getting the directive from the commission as what needs to be done and 
you know, I commend them for their continued uh, focus on the safety of employees, uh, which I've seen throughout the commission that that team approach that uh, we're all in this together and we're going to do the right thing. Um, they've been uh, having that same uh, approach to the offices reopening. So I just mentioned uh, that uh, Commissioner Cameron and Mr. Stebbins have been helpful in that area and turn it over to them if they have any comments. Really quickly, um, Interim Director Wells, I just um, want to comment on the collaborative nature of this process, meaning uh, Bruce Mann may, you know, he knows what has to happen with all of those gaming agents as far as reopening, but uh, what he doesn't have to do on his own is figure out all of the health and safety issues on top of that. The team is helping, and these meetings have been so collaborative, you know, whether it be Derek or, or Troop D or Loretta with the legal issues. They are helping each working group. It happens to be um, gaming agents and, and racing first and then jumping right in with uh, racing, meaning what are those best practices? Alex has got a lot that she's doing with regard to getting it open, but the, the other folks are helping tremendously with the legal and the health and safety measures. So I appreciate being part of this team who cares so much about getting it right. What are the best practices? How do we do it safely? Um, so that has been really apparent to me that we're not leaving anybody out on an island. You figure it out. The team is helping each other out through this whole thing. And I just, you know, commend Karen, your whole team for, um, for these efforts. I, I would just add to, to Gail's comments and, and certainly it's been a collaborative effort and, and there's some, uh, as Karen highlighted, there's some unknowns that uh, are evolving every day. So our ability to stay on top of those changes and new requirements is going to be important. Um, but I also like the fact that very early on, this team established the notion that we wanted to open up lines of communication for our staff so they could reach out to us, they could tell us what their concerns were, whether that was reporting to their department director, what their uh, anxiousness might be about returning to the office, or as Karen mentioned, using public transportation or what have you to get to work. So, uh, you know, the notion of team continues to be reinforced and, uh, you know, keeping the lines of communication open among all the staff is just a, a, a tremendous component to the collaborative work that's been going on. Great. And any other questions or uh, comments from any of the commissioners? Excellent, excellent work. And um, very much appreciated the detail. And of course, I think you've expressed how complex it is. I think from my perspective, I've been reading the guidance that's provided to the public. And I find it to be very accessible. And, and uh, I commend the Governor's Advisory Board for getting products out to, to us that is accessible. And, and, and easy to understand, and they're looking to, to try to make it friendly, and I'm so happy that HRD did invite us in to get the additional expertise. We might as well be all working uh, together and sharing that expertise, so thank you, and, and thanks to everybody's efforts. And I understand when you say we're gonna focus on the casino opening, that would be the, with respect to the reopening of the office, those are the employees who have to be on the the um, casino property, the gaming Correct. agents. Uh, we're gonna work with um, Mark and the Game Sense Advisors, and then our, our GEU. And then the idea is in accordance with the governor's uh, recommendation to have the offices actually reopen later. Correct. And that's what the rest of the state employees are or that approach is being taken across the state for all state offices? Yeah, the, the, so the directive talks about the remote work that can be done should be mm -hmm. continued to do so. Now we have the advantage because we were uh, forward thinking in the IT side of the house so that we can do a lot of work remotely. So that puts us in an advantage and may put us in a different category, yeah. but, um, but generally we're following <laughs> exactly what's going on across the state uh, depending yeah. on what your capabilities are. Got it. So the standard is if we're able to work remotely effectively, right. uh, we'll just continue and phase that in later. 
Right. As exactly. needed. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Excellent. Very, very good work. And thanks, uh, Gail and Bruce, for, you, for uh, helping in that effort. Yes. Karen, do you uh, have another? Yes. Yeah, so item 4B is the Plainridge Park license renewal update. So I'll turn that over to Joe Delaney uh, to give you an update on where we are on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, real you, brief update on, on Plainridge Park uh, uh, relicensing. So on Monday, on June 1st, we received um, a series of attestations from PPC as part of their license uh, renewal application. And these addressed uh, 16 items on our list of application requirements. So they're, they're getting there on, on, on getting us the information. Um, we're expecting the remaining um, attestations on June 15th. So some of the main items that they have left are uh, internal controls, some RFA2 compliance, um, regional tourism and marketing, um, and information regarding horse racing compliance. Um, so they haven't gotten us that information yet and also the application fee. And you might remember from the last meeting, we mentioned that uh, PPC might be requesting a deferment of that payment. That is not the case any longer. Uh, they expect to get us that payment uh, on the 15th with the rest of their information, which is great. So I guess they'll need to work with Derek uh, on how to get us the payment. So. So that's moving ahead. And then assuming that we receive all of the remaining materials on June 15th, um, we should be able to have a vote on June 18th uh, regarding as to the adequacy of the application. Um, and then at that point, we can put together a schedule uh, for the commission's deliberations on the license renewal itself. So long and short, everything's moving forward um, as we've expected and um, you know, no hiccups at this point. Joe, Thanks. This, Thanks, Joe. I'll just turn it over to the commissioners if, any, if they have any questions. Commissioner Stebbins for Joe. Sure, Joe. Thanks for your good work. Just a, a quick question. Uh, obviously, before this uh, pandemic hit us, part of the process was going to be some uh, type of public hearing to hear from the community. I don't know what thought we've given to that as we deal with uh, you know social distancing and everything else, but I don't know if you want to take a minute to address that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think it's still a plan to have a public hearing of some sort, uh, given our, our new circumstances, it might be one of these HD meetings or something to that effect. I think it was our intention to have something down in Plainville, which would give people opportunities. You know, it doesn't sound like that will be possible or, you know, unless it's deferred for a little while, maybe it will be possible, but it sounds more likely that we'll have to do a, a meeting of this fashion, I would Thanks, Joe. Other questions for Joe? Um, I have a question, more um, process. Karen and Joe, Loretta, is the schedule for deliberation something we could address at our next agenda setting meeting so that we get a sense of timing and what that will constitute with the threshold understanding we still have to vote on the 18th about the sufficiency of the application. Correct. Yes, I, I think you're correct on that. Uh, uh, scheduling wise, we need to schedule the uh, sort of that suitability portion, which I expect will be done shortly. So uh, at our agenda setting meet on, on Wednesday, we could talk about when that would happen. Uh, and so and, and taking into consideration Commissioner Stebbins, uh, I, yeah, the, the reiterating the idea of a public hearing, any other components of the deliberations, what would what needs to be scheduled. If that, if we could at least start that discussion this Wednesday on. I think that, that makes sense, yes. Yeah, okay. you know, some, some of the other things that we were looking at were, um, you know, looking at some documents on site um, and, you know, doing sort of a, a bit of an audit of documents mm -hmm. on site. Now, you know, if the opening, proceed, the reopening proceeds um, according to sort of current schedules, that's probably something that we can fit in that schedule and go down on site and, and still be able to do that. Um, you know, once, once our gaming agents are back in now, clearly one of the concerns is trying to reopen the facility while trying to relicense them at the same time will have uh, certainly some, some challenges associated with that. So I think we just need to be mindful of, of, 
of that and, and schedule this, uh, the commission's uh, additional work and deliberations sort of in conjunction with that reopening. And with that said, of course, there's still plenty of unknowns. Commissioner Zuniga, did you have any comments? I'm, I am recalling that we, and, and, I, and forgive me, I haven't looked back in the records, but we did have a memo that outlined the process. And I'm not sure if the deliberation piece and all those other components like this audit are in that memo. I, my memory's failing me. Yeah, they, they are. There's, there's a whole final review procedure that we yeah. have in there. So yeah. um, I can get you all copies of that letter. That's the letter we sent out to PPC on February uh, 28th, I think it was. Um, yeah. Yeah, February 28th. Maybe in advance, if you could recirculate that to us um, in advance of Wednesday, that might be helpful. And sure. anything else, that would be great. And then we can just start to schedule out uh, for the... Uh, meetings during the summer, again, with the understanding that we still have that threshold decision. Excellent. Any more, any other questions, Commissioner Zunica? No, maybe um, just only, only to reiterate perhaps uh, what you were alluding to, uh, you know, in February, um, we had all the intention, frankly, of doing a lot of our work prior to June 24th. Uh, and the time, the timeline really lent itself for that. But of course, in early March, uh, everything you know changed, and so um, as you say, the threshold now is just the sufficiency, and I, I, I'm glad to hear that it's moving along. Uh, when it comes to the review, uh, including the visit on site that I had uh, at least vision for uh, some financial documentation, etc., um, we have a lot of flexibility re relative to to the time frame. So long as we've deemed that that information that has been has been successfully submitted uh, sufficiently submitted in time, okay. um, I, just so you know or everybody knows, um, I have scheduled um, we've scheduled a uh, a phone call internally with uh, the financial investigating team, uh, Loretta and Monica, and um, there'll be uh, we'll be discussing exactly you know some of these. Um, uh, logistics relative to reviewing maybe um, using uh, uh, this type of technology or emails or or uh, on-site uh, uh, visits. Any further questions before we turn back to Karen? Okay, Karen. Okay, so that concludes uh, the administrative updates. So we're all set with item four in the agenda. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. We're moving on now to item number five. Uh, again, um, a matter that was truly ready back in, I believe, February, and we appreciate uh, all the um, patience that was exercised as we uh, pushed this matter back on our agenda. It deserved some special time in the agenda and to have squeezed it in would have been inappropriate. Uh, this was work that started in 2018. I want to acknowledge the efforts of Commissioners O'Brien, Commissioner uh, Cameron, and uh, um, Loretta, and, and Carrie, and Troop D. And then, of course, we have had the benefit of outside expertise as well. So thank you very much. This is a presentation on a sexual harassment policy and regulation for our licensees. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Cameron to, to start the the process. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, this item, as you mentioned, has been something uh, we have been working on for, you know, many, many months. Um, thought it deserved some attention in light of all of the issues um, that we were dealing with uh, last year. And, um, but I, but I certainly, the working group in general doesn't want to be tone deaf to what is happening in our country right now as a retired law enforcement official. You know, I'm certainly pained by watching videos and the unnecessary loss of life. Um, so race discrimination is certainly in the forefront. In fact, it's the genesis of every discrimination law it started with race discrimination. And I'll have uh, Commissioner O'Brien speak more to the, um, the law itself. But I think um, as a committee, we're dealing with this issue today, but as regulators, um, I, I think I can speak for everybody that we are supportive of um, some public safety reforms that are urgently needed. 
And we will do our small part as a commission to be vigilant about making sure employees, patrons are treated with dignity and respect, um, no matter who they are, um, setting the tone um, at the top. And I think we have our uh, GEU members who do set that tone. I've had many discussions with them about these particular issues and um, uh, the leadership team really understands it. And uh, so I didn't, I didn't want to start this discussion without uh, mentioning the fact that we are cognizant of everything happening in the world. And this has been um, certainly not more important, but it, it's just uh, an issue that we are handling. Commissioner O'Brien, do you want to uh, add to that? Uh, certainly. Um, I think one of the things I do want to make clear, and it's clear from the caption of what we're proposing um, today, is this: the genesis of the subcommittee may have started with the sexual harassment allegations that, that we dealt with in, in large part last year. However, um, it was not myopic. We were looking at something broader than that. And as you can see from the caption of the proposed reg, this is a broader um, rule in terms of um, what we're hoping to do to create a baseline and keep an eye on all types of unlawful harassment and discrimination. There are parts of what are being proposed today that specifically reference sexual harassment in part because the MCAD has very specific um, models and policies on sexual harassment, but I want to make clear that um, no one should think that it is in any way um, denigrating any other form of harassment or discrimination. We're making specific references to procedures that exist because we want that to be the threshold. However, this is designed to ensure that um, the employees, the customers at these establishments um, have basic fundamental fairness and treatment in all of their encounters. Um, Carrie will go into some of more the specifics in terms of the machinations of what we're proposing today, but um, I do think even something as dry as talking of pol a policy and procedure, I do think speaks to what we all need to be doing right now, which is um, laws, policies, and procedures that are enforced properly can be very powerful tools. And even if this is a small way that we are standing up for what needs to be happening right now, um, this very dry discussion about a reg, I think, is actually um, the opportune time to be talking about it, given what's going on right now. And, and with that, I would um, defer to Carrie to give um, an overview of what we're proposing. Sure, thank you, Commissioner O'Brien, and good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, so with that, Carrie. as our background, I do just wanna note also before I run through a summary that um, we do have our outside labor and employment counsel, uh, Maura McLaughlin from Morgan Brown and Joy on the call with us. We consulted with her on um, best practices related to these issues. Um, and she did contribute a great deal to this regulation and she's available for questions um, that I, I might not be equipped to answer that are um, really focused on labor and employment issues today. So she is on the call with us if those questions come up. Um, so uh, in summary, uh, the regulation you have in your packet, 205 CMR 138.72, um, this requires the gaming licensees to have a system of internal controls that includes policies and procedures relative to ensuring a workplace free from discrimination and harassment. Some of the highlights of the regulation include a requirement that those policies and procedures comply with all elements of federal, state, and local law and incorporate all elements of the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination Model Sexual Harassment Policy a requirement that the policies include written procedures outlining how concerns or allegations regarding unlawful discrimination, harassment, and retaliation are to be reported, including multiple reporting options, a requirement that training on unlawful discrimination, harassment, and retaliation be provided by the gaming licensee to all employees within 90 days of hire and every two years thereafter, a requirement that the gaming licensee review its policies and procedures every two years to ensure compliance with all federal, state, and local laws related to unlawful discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. A requirement that the gaming licensee maintain detailed information related to each concern, allegation, or claim of unlawful discrimination, harassment, or retaliation reported during the previous calendar year. 
and a provision authorizing the commission to review any records pertaining to those policies and procedures. Um, we have met with the licensees regarding this regulation and we did receive positive feedback. That was back in February. Um, and at this point, um, we're looking to the commission for guidance uh, and potential possible vote if you um, feel comfortable beginning the promulgation process at this point. So I think I'll open it up if there are any questions on the regulation, um, any questions for Maura or any for me or Commissioner Cameron or O'Brien. Just, just um, it may go without saying, but it, this, um, you know, if any, if there's any future changes to federal, um, local, uh, or state laws, of course, this would incorporate those future changes. Is that, is that correct? Yes, exactly. Mr. Stebbins. Yeah, uh, just two quick points, and maybe um, our outside attorney can jump in on a couple of these. First of all. Um, thanks to the team that worked on this. Um, with, with respect to process um, and, and looking at the draft regs, is it inherent, and I think this is what we heard about, or seems to be a perception that when a complaint is filed, sometimes the complainant doesn't hear back about how a case has been uh, uh, disposed of or investigated, is it inherent in the regs that that component of the process is built in for our licensees to follow? Maura, do you want to address that one? So I think Kathy, she's, Maura McLaughlin is on by name if you wanted to unmute her. Star six. I don't know if Kathy also needs to unmute though as well. I did, sorry, oh, just coming through. Sure, she is. Yep, there she is. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, yes, it is contained in the thinking of these uh, proposed regulations that, uh, uh, where appropriate, which there may occasionally be times uh, when it might not, but following the Mass Commission Against Discrimination model regulations, where appropriate, at the conclusion of an investigation, a complaining party is told of the results of the investigation. Okay, all right, thank you for that. The, the other um, question, I, um, and I think it's a point that's raised wonderfully in the, in the, in the draft regulations about uh, you know, the licensee shall ensure and shall inform employees that individuals of different genders are available for reporting of complaints. Um, that that would seem to be a, a helpful resource for somebody filing a, a harassment concern. Is there any best practices that suggest uh, having a team, uh, you know, having a diverse team would um, be a valuable resource for somebody perhaps filing a claim around discrimination, if there's any best practices related to that? So at present, I'm not aware of a sort of specified best practice because I think your question, if I understand correctly, takes into the idea that we are prohibiting discrimination and harassment on all protected categories, not just sex. Right. And so right. um, while it might be difficult for even licensees as robust as the, I'm sorry, organizations as robust as the licensees to have someone on staff of every um, religion, national origin, race. Um, certainly, I think these regulations contemplate having the persons who will be receiving complaints be uh, trained in and fully aware of appropriate complaint and investigation processes so that persons of any protected category can come forward and know that they will be taken seriously and investigated appropriately. Okay. And I think just, and correct me if I'm wrong, Maura, but um, I believe the requirement that opposite genders be available if, is, is stems from um, a threshold requirement in one of the regulatory schemes. Um, I believe that it doesn't speak to anything beyond the gender. The idea of, of um, persons of different genders being available to take complaints is drawn directly from the NCAD's um, suggested model policies and best practices with respect to harassment um, investigations um, 
so yes, you're right that we do actually have a, a scheme and a, a recommendation from the Massachusetts agency tasked with preventing and remedying discrimination as to the employees of different genders. Uh, it has not at this point been expanded to cover other protected categories beyond uh, gender and sex. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. I have a couple of comments. I don't know um, if I'm, I don't want to jump in ahead of Commissioner Zunica, are you all set for right now? Okay, just a couple of comments. One, um, I'm, I'm wondering about the, when the MCAD model policy was last updated. Mark, can you comment on that? Sure, the MCAD model policy hasn't been updated in a number of years. And again, the model policy at the MCAD is targeted toward sexual harassment. I will say best practices in the employment law field, as I understand them and as my firm generally practices, is that when these policies are put together in an actual employment setting, they are drafted to encompass all forms of unlawful discriminatory harassment. So when you say it hasn't been updated for a while, I just want to just, I, I think this is a fine policy for us to model our, this against, and we know that we also are looking at other license, the licensees have their own. But I, I do think that we should just acknowledge that this hasn't been updated, I don't believe, since, you know, I, and I'm, it's unfair to probably label this, but the Me Too movement, I mean, it's much bigger than a Me Too movement, but just so that we acknowledge that the MCA Dean um, policy is, a, is in need probably of, of being updated, but you're comfortable with that in terms of a framework for us that, it, and, and what you just qualified just now more, that it can be applied um, as the proper framework for this purpose. I'm very comfortable with the way it's drafted in your proposed regulations. It does say that it is a floor. It is at a minimum, it shall incorporate those elements. And I think you're absolutely correct that the MCAD's policy predates uh, the Me Too movement, to state it simply. I think there are some tweaks that most of us looking at it would um, make for example i think it still refers to a lot of he or she yes. whereas now we are in a world where we very much understand that we uh try to avoid gendered language in these policies that said i think that it's core elements in terms of uh, providing a definition of unlawful harassment making sure that people know that it's taken seriously making sure that it's clear that persons who engage in inappropriate conduct, whether or not it rises to the level of unlawful harassment, are subject to the employer's disciplinary policies. I think it's still a very good foundation and framework for you, yes. That's excellent, it's a, a really helpful clarifier for me, Laura, so thank you. And then the only other, and I'm, I assume, if we haven't, that we should probably be in touch somehow, maybe uh, Commissioner O'Brien, Commissioner Cameron, to MCAD to let them know that we use their guidance because I think that's really important. And I like, you know, I acknowledge that it's a floor, but it's a really good floor, you know? So, um, and then the only other comment in Commissioner O'Brien, you and I have been working quite closely with the independent monitor just on in the, in the oversight of it. Uh, can we make sure to, if this goes through today on the first steps or whatever, to keep the independent monitor updated on this. There's an intersection. Commissioner Cameron, do you agree? Uh, yes, I know we received guidance at the beginning not to involve them, and Commissioner O'Brien can probably speak to that. That's but right. Certainly notifying them it would be appropriate so that they have um, all the tools they need to, to do their job. Just in, in, just in terms of making sure we're being transparent with them. Commissioner O'Brien, do you agree with that? With yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That we deliberately did not engage them on this topic um, during the drafting and the presentation phase. If this is in fact voted today, absolutely. We can vote. Okay, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Those are my two questions. Uh, Commissioner Zunica, do you have any questions? All set? I got the thumbs up for those who are listening and not watching. Okay. Um, 
Next steps, Commissioner O'Brien, Commissioner Cameron, or Carrie. It's really a question of, um, Commissioner Cameron and I have been working on this for some time. The question is whether you other three commissioners feel comfortable um, moving on this today or whether you would like us to mark it up for the next hearing for a vote. But we can vote on it now if everyone is comfortable voting on it. And I just want to also acknowledge um, both Troop Dan Nevada too, because absolutely. So, um, I just meant from a, I, I meant from a preparation to vote standard, not not the lion's share of the work. No, no, no. I'm just saying in terms of um, I just hadn't recognized you mentioned Carrie, but if they wanted to chime in as well, I should... and, and Elaine Driscoll was very helpful with this as well. Okay. As part of the working group. Oh, excellent, excellent, Elaine. Too, if you want to chime in. Um, <clears throat> Well, my commissioners, it sounds as though that there could be, um, we could move ahead then on the regulatory process. And it doesn't have to be emergency regs, correct, Carrie? That's right. And just a reminder also that if you do vote to begin the process today, that certainly doesn't mean that we can't make changes throughout the process. Oh, okay. Yeah. Excellent. Ma Madam Chair, I'm comfortable with moving you know, this starts the regulatory process where there's more opportunity for public input, but I think the, the work here is is great and the policy is 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 very clear and the fact that our licensees have had some input into it already, I think it's ready to go. Well, I'm very impressed by the work and, and the efforts and the collaboration uh, you had a great team on a really important topic. And as Gail points out, it, it's only a subset of the important work that needs to be done whenever we address discrimination, intimidation, um, and retaliation. So um, I appreciate the effort. I should note that you know, interim executive director has um, agreed, and I applaud this, to uh, work while we're in remote on e-training on implicit bias for our own sake and our own purposes, which as you know is a step in, in the right direction. Every every step matters and it will allow us to engage in important conversations, even if it's in within ourselves and not within a a, a, a real classroom. The, the, the real classrooms can occur at the right time down the road. But at least getting some e-training for ourselves to reflect will, will make us feel better informed and feeling like we're participating in these important discussions. So, um, and it's all part of this discussion. So I am I feel very prepared, Commissioner Zuniga. Yeah, uh, same same here. I think it uh, it's it's appropriate. It's been very well um, deliberated upon, and I think uh, starting the promulgation uh, uh, process would be um, would be ideal at this time. I've not heard a motion yet, correct? But we do need a motion. So, I'll, uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the Small Business Impact Statement for 205 CMR 138.72 Policies and Procedures for Ensuring a Workplace Free from Unlawful Discrimination, Harassment, and, retali and Retaliation, as included in the Commission's text. Second. Any discussion? Other than thank you. Okay, a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Vote yes, 5-0, Shara, thank you so much. Madam Chair, I further move that the commission approve the version of 205 CMR 138.72, policies and procedures for ensuring a workplace free from unlawful discrimination, harassment, and retaliation as included in the commissioner's packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. Thank you. Any further questions on the reg proposal itself? Hearing none, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. I vote yes, thank you, 5-0. Thank you, excellent work. Um, and again, thank you for your patience as it moved around in the agenda. And I look forward to the future discussions. Thank you. Does anybody need to stretch? <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Zuniga, you all set right now? Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> moving on then to item number six, 
Dr. Lightbound, we have reports on racing, and I know that Mr. Grossman will be joining you. Oh, Dr. Lightbound, you gotta unmute. Can you, or do I need to do something? There we go. Okay, excellent. So good morning. Um, good morning. As uh, Executive Director Wells uh, mentioned earlier, racing has been moved to phase three. Uh, as we all know, the uh, COVID pandemic um, and the response to it is very fluid. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, Chris McElaine for Penn submitted a draft protocol um, for reopening that would um, incorporate a large part of what the harness horsemen had already um, submitted. And it also provided some consistency with what um, Penn is proposing on the casino side. Um, we met again last Friday, the Harness Horsemen's Association members and um, Chris for Penn um, to discuss the plans further. Um, and then on Monday, we got the news that uh, racing had been uh, moved to phase three. So we've been in contact since then as well. Um, yesterday, the Department of Agriculture Resources sent out a um, COVID plan that they had uh, devised. And um, we've looked at it, uh, done a quick review, um, Penn, uh, Harness Horsemen's Association and I, um, it's similar to the other plans we've been uh, looking at, and um, we'll definitely keep it in mind as we continue to develop the plan. Um, tomorrow, uh, I've got a couple of internal meetings um, with HR and legal to discuss um, racing onboarding of our seasonal employees, and then um, with the MDC re, uh, reopening working group um, to discuss more along those lines. I wanna stress that um, I'm mentioning these meetings, but this is not the first time um, I've met or talked to um, members of our commission about this issue. These are ongoing discussions that we've been having about um, what the best ways and best practices are um, for our own staff and um, for developing a plan to work with Penn and the Harness Horsemen for reopening. Um, as we discuss these plans, um, some, some of the things that we thought might be important and might work um, several months ago, maybe don't apply anymore, um, or um, things we've learned more about the virus, um, or heard of different things from other groups that might be valuable for us. So um, this is an ongoing process of um, developing these plans. Um, does the commission have any questions? Um. I, I do one out of curiosity, and maybe you don't know the answer, of, of, of course, uh, as to how this may play out. But um, when it comes to um, some of the racing, uh, the, the horse people, uh, they go to a lot of different uh, places, uh, you know, throughout the Northeast uh, to, to, to make their livelihood. Um, how um, do, you, do you envision there might be some restrictions um, from one place to the next, uh, some intrastate type of travel um, that might have to be sort of considered in some way? Yes, there, there might be. Um, some states um, have, for instance, with their um, jockeys, they have very, uh, like a closed colony, basically. And um, if anybody new is coming in, they have whole procedures that they have to go through. Um, and it's almost prohibitive of having um, new people come in. Obviously, that wouldn't work at Plain Ridge, where we do have, um, we rely on um, people from other states coming in, as well as our people from Massachusetts. So for instance, um, instead of um, having the driver's lounge open, um, if it was a closed colony, um, we'll probably, um, at least right now, we're looking at just having the um, driver's lounge closed, um, recognizing that um, we won't have a, um, Closed population that would be in there every day that it's going to be different people on each race day. Um, again, um, when we reopen, maybe things have changed some um, or maybe there's different numbers involved um, and we may be um, able to change something like that. But for right now, that's something that we're looking at. So Dr. Lightbound, uh, as I understand the processes that comes out of the, um, the governor's advisory board, reopening advisory board, for each industry, there will be specific guidelines that will be overarching over the industry, be overarching for you know, restaurants, just the guidelines and protocols were just for this phase, beginning of phase two, which 
is still, I think they're all deciding when that actually will occur. And um, race tracks were shifted from phase four to phase three last week. But as we are anticipating, there'll be guidelines that will be specific to the casino reopening. And I suspect we'll also see guidelines that are specific to the race, racing industry. So as much as we will be looking at PPC's guidance and the, the um, horse racing community's guidance and our guidance, we will have to uh, comply with that guidance. And so in many ways, we have to wait for what the, um, the governor's office will issue for protocols that um, are directly related to that industry. Is that correct? Yes, so, that's correct. And yeah. obviously, um, you know, uh, the, any guidelines would have to not only follow the, the state um, requirements, but also the CDC. And if the local board of health has their own um, requirements, because that's happened in some states where um, a track may have met um, the CDC requirements and their state government requirements, but the local board of health had, um, you know, their own input and had different things that they wanted. Well, that's actually one of my questions. Do we, do we have any with Plainville's um, public health? Have you reached out to them in terms of these issues at all? Because we do have that as well, too. Yeah, I have not. I don't know if um, Penn has with the, you know, casino as well as the racetrack. Um, yeah. Chris Backerling from um, Penn is on the line today. And um, Bob McHugh, president of the Harness Horsemen, is on as well if commissioners have questions. So those are important yeah. conversations to continue with as well, because you've yes. highlighted all the, the other um, regulators on the public health side. So I just want to make sure that you know everybody understands that we will be informed by all the expertise of the public health and yes. make decisions that. And then, in turn, I understand that when you um, come up with recommendations and I know you'll be working with Commissioner Cameron and the horse racing community and PPC that you'll come and present to us a plan that we'll be able to reflect on. Yes. Does that sound right, Gail? It does. And um, Plainville has been very engaged with uh, PPC, uh, both racing and gaming. So I suspect they will continue this engagement when it comes to a real, a safe reopening. So yeah, their public uh, health, there'd be probably, uh, yeah, good so we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that happens. But as I said, our experience with, with the township is they are very, very engaged partners, um, which has been a very helpful thing over the years. Can I ask one other question just so that I think I understand it, but I want to make sure I've got it clear in terms of initial steps that are um, It's not just, you know, turn on the switch. Mm -hmm. In addition to all that the the horse racing community has to do to prepare their horses to actually come to either a qualifying race or a race. What has to happen at the site and who is responsible for it. And I know this is a preliminary question. We don't need to get into too much in the weeds today, but if in terms of preparation of the track, et cetera. Right, um, Penn will um, be in charge of getting the track itself ready and um, the barn area on the paddock. Um, we do anticipate some changes will be needed to make, be made. Um, and we'll have to come to the commission with um, some requests um, just to let them know there, there may be certain things that we're going to need to do differently because of the COVID that we will need to bring in front of the commission to, um, you know, get approval or at least um, let them know that, you know, that's what we're planning on doing. Um, we have um, a few items that were on the agenda from way back um, March 3rd, 12th, I guess it was, when we got um, uh, cut off in the commission meeting because of COVID. Um, and so, you know, those routine things will need to come up for a vote. Um, I did um, assure the harness horsemen that um, those, the commission obviously um, will um, have meetings where those votes can occur um, and we won't be holding up the opening of the track because things have not been voted on. So, um, and you know, one of the things that we'll need to um, bring up is, is what the actual date for reopening um, the track will be, um, you know, when qualifiers will start and then when the actual um, opening of the racetrack will be. And if I could just add to that, um, Dr. Lightbaum, um, 
the racing officials at Penn National and the Harness Horsemen Association have each taken the initiative to really explore best practices. So each of them are really concerned, um, you know, whether it be the commission or Penn or um, the association, very, very much interested in uh, health and safety for everyone involved. So it's been nice to see that engagement by all three um, stakeholders. And, yes. um, and so I think the next phase will be, okay, what are the final plans and educating everyone as to what those plans are. So uh, Dr. Lightbaum, you, I, I haven't asked you one question in which you didn't know a track that was already doing it or there's some lessons learned over here or watching this closely. So I do appreciate your efforts as well as the other stakeholders to really um, dig in and educate and try to put the health and safety um, needs in, in the forefront for this to be successful. Yes, and as we've worked on our plans, you know, there's the, the big categories like wear a mask and, and um, use hand sanitizer. Um, but with racing, there's a lot of different protocols and we, you know, uh, need to drill down on those and see, um, it, because there's also, with those protocols, there's a lot of human um, interaction, close human interaction. So um, that's one of the things we've been looking at is, is what are those kind of like touch points and um, what we can do to um, minimize uh, that type of close interaction. And Dr. Lightburn, as, as uh, noted, we are ready to be nimble. We don't, we, we can convene a meeting, you know, with proper notice um, to be able to address issues as they might unexpectedly arise to the extent we can predict that that's perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and to the extent, you know, we want to make sure that everybody is heard. You know, we did have a successful roundtable with the three licensees for the casino um, industry. Uh, Commissioner Cameron and Dr. Lightbound, I invite you, and, 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 and I know, Todd, you've been working really closely on these issues, to think about whether we should convene a similar kind of meeting to really chew on some of the nuances around public health um, issues. Uh, so that we can anticipate to make sure we do get the guidance because we all know we're not the experts. Commissioner O'Brien, I know this is something that you've talked about and I've talked about. We want to make sure that we're never voting on a public health decision where we're not fully informed. So if it makes sense to convene what was, I, re, I viewed it as a round table as opposed to where we had all stakeholders around the table, uh, we could do the same for the the racing community, if that, that would be helpful at this stage, but I, I leave it to you to th reflect upon. And, yeah, and we could certainly do that. And I should have mentioned in our um, meeting last Friday, um, both uh, Director Wells and Executive Director Wells and um, uh, Todd were both on that um, call as well. And yeah. Todd was involved yes, in the uh, earlier call, but we could certainly mm -hmm. in, include, you know, especially after um, our meetings tomorrow, it would uh, certainly be appropriate to have uh, Commissioner Cameron or um, somebody, you know, or, even, or, or even if we have a, a, a full commission meeting is what I was really suggesting. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah, right. to have all of us hear the same thing. That's really, um, Commissioner O'Brien, I, I wanted to allow you to chime in. I, I, I mentioned the public health piece because we'd hate to be at a juncture where you're presenting and, and have something that we wish we had more information and we wouldn't be able to vote on in good conscience. Commissioner O'Brien? No, I agree with that. I think that it starts the ball rolling. It also makes you realize what you what we don't know in terms of someone like me who's not as familiar with racing, and I wouldn't want to be a hold up on something unnecessarily. Um, so I, I do think it would be helpful. Great, Commissioner Zuniga. Yes, are you nodding? You like the idea too? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Uh, I think it's good for uh, the public to know, uh, much like uh, similarly to what we went through. But last time with the casinos, uh, I think there's the real um, uh, need for uh, for us to talk about it in uh, in a public meeting. Okay, so we'll circle back on that and and organize a similar type of exchange so that we can at least highlight the the more difficult uh, public health matters, and then of course the operational issues too that we're more familiar with. I just want to acknowledge that um, our colleague Brian Fitzgerald. I see him. I just am going to give you a, a wave. Um, Brian is the uh, chair of the Horse Racing Com Committee um, and uh, yesterday held a public uh, meeting and which I attended 
So I just wanna say thank you for joining us visually. There are many colleagues on, I think we have over 130 people joining, but your face popped up, so I did wanna say hello. Um, and of Ma course- Madam uh, Chair, can I just ask uh, Director Lightbound a quick question? I think yeah. I probably already know the answer to this. Um, she and I had a chance to catch up earlier this week and it's always greatly appreciate her, her leadership and uh, being our go-to person on everything racing. Um, Alex, is it, is it safe to assume that other kind of pre-opening precautionary safety steps that we have taken, um, such as having somebody come in and review the addition, you know, the condition of the track is still going to be part of the, the plan before opening? Yes. That, that was the uh, only condition I believe we put on the license this year was that they do the um, uh, pre-opening inspection. So yes, they're, and they're still planning on doing that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, so all of the regular operational requirements and any conditions that were established before COVID have to be addressed too. So that in the right. regular course of your work, mm -hmm. Dr. Lightbound takes a good deal of coordination. So I think my point around maybe getting convening is so that we we don't want to hold up progress with any unexpected questions. So um, I'll work with uh, Karen um, uh, and you, Alex, to see yes. how we can coordinate it. An hour long uh, special public meeting where we can get all voices around our virtual table. That will be great. Thank okay, you. excellent. Okay, good. Um, anything further, Dr. Um, No, just uh, reiterating that it is a fluid situation and, um, you know, that we're uh, tr trying to keep um, abreast of all the different things that are going on with uh, COVID and with uh, um, different um, agencies and what they're recommending. And while the governor has said that each phase is expected to be no less than three weeks, we just, we really don't know what phase, what date. There's no date certain, it's data driven. So um, we'll continue to operate on those assumptions too, no date certain. All right, excellent. Um, then turning over now, you'll be working with Todd on the next issue. Mr. Grossman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, everyone. Um, if I may, I just want to take one second to thank everyone for the thoughtful comments and perspectives on the matters uh, facing us and our nation at what is most certainly a pivotal time um, in our history. So thank you for that. Um, the proposal before you to amend 149.04 um, is here before you at the request of the Horse Racing Committee, which reviewed the language as the chair referenced at its meeting yesterday. Uh, there is actually one area that needs a little bit of modification and we'll get into that uh, momentarily. But as the chair also referenced, we're joined here today by Brian Fitzgerald, who is the chair. He's uh, three over and four down on my screen. I'm not sure uh, if everyone can see him. Um, if you haven't met Brian, Brian is an attorney um, with offices in uh, East Longmeadow. He's the gubernatorial appointee uh, to the committee, and he's doing really uh, tremendous work uh, for us. And I just wanted to thank him for joining us here today and for all of his efforts. I also, if I may, just wanted to thank the other members of the committee who are also really spending a lot of time um, on the matters that are before you here today and have done really great work. Uh, Peter Goldberg, uh, Emily Katunik, who is the representative from the treasurer's office, uh, Joe Savage, uh, Savage uh, and of course our own Commissioner Gail Cameron, who spends a lot of time um, on this matter as well. And of course, I'd be remiss if we didn't thank Dr. Lightbound, who's really the backbone of our whole racing uh, regulatory operation. So thank you to everyone um, for all of your great work here. This matter um, has come before you, as I said, at the request of the committee. Um, the committee has requested that the commission adopt this proposal by emergency um, if enactment can be done uh, responsibly and comfortably uh, to each of you. Um, this would allow for any adjustments to the split uh, to be in place relatively contemporaneous with the possible commencement of the racing season at Plain Ridge Park. Um, and I'd be happy to, to walk through just the proposal 
um, and address any questions, or we can start, um, and I would certainly invite Brian and, and Alex to join me, uh, by discussing the process of the governance of the fund itself, uh, if that would be helpful, because really the amendments pertain to the Racehorse Development Fund distribution process. Um, so if it would be helpful, I'm certainly prepared to uh, do a little background um, on the fund. There's, a, there's some background in the memo that was submitted as part of the commissioner's packet, um, but um, if, if that would be helpful, again, um, we can start by just talking about the fund. First, before we start, uh, uh, Todd, I, I thought the memo was excellent, and thank you very much. It, it really Great. provided... Uh, helpful uh, background for me. Uh, so uh, it laid out the, the regu what the implications are for the regulation. Um, I'm happy always to hear um, any further background on those facing matters. Commissioner O'Brien, do you agree? Shall we? Oh, it would, I would benefit. Please. Excellent. I'm happy to do that. And uh, of course, welcome uh, again, Alex Bryan and Commissioner Cameron uh, to make any clarifications or uh, corrections as, as we go through this. So the uh, Racehorse Development Fund is established in Chapter 23K at Section 60, which, by the way, also created the Horse Racing Committee. That's all contained in that one section of the statute. Um, and the fund itself is made up of monies received from a number of different sources, but it primarily comes from the, da the daily uh, assessments based on gross gaming revenues from the gaming licensees. It includes the well-known 9% assessment on PPCs, um, gross gaming revenues under section 55C of chapter 23K. And it also includes two and a half percent of the 25% tax on the gross gaming revenue uh, from the category one licensees, and that's under section 59 uh, 2L. The commission is the administrator of the fund and directed to distribute the available monies in the fund between the two breeds, which are of course thoroughbreds and standard breads. And section 60C says that the funds must be distributed um, as follows, that 80% essentially of the funds go to fund purses for live races, 16% go into the respective breeds breeding programs as approved by the commission. And 4% goes to fund health and pension or health and welfare benefits uh, for members of the horsemen's organizations. And there's a little more description in the statute as to what that can cover as well. As for the actual decision-making process, section 60 says that, and I have a couple of quotes here, the, Horse Racing Committee shall make recommendations on how the funds shall be distributed between thoroughbred and standard bred racing facilities to support the thoroughbred and standard bred horse racing industries under the section. The committee shall submit distribution recommendations to the clerks of the Senate and the House of Representatives not later than 30 days before submitting the recommendation to the commission for final approval. It's important to pause um, at this point and note that when it comes to adjusting the regulated split though, uh, the statute uh, says that the commission shall only change the distribution percentage upon a recommendation by the committee. So the commission is it's not um, empowered to on its own change the distribution percentage um, without a recommendation. And just uh, to be clear, um, the distribution percentage uh, that's referenced in the statute is what's colloquially been referred to as the split or determining the split. The word split doesn't actually appear in the statute, but that's what it's, it's commonly referred to. So the distribution percentage is what we mean, uh, or split is what we mean by distribution percentage. So the, as far as the past practice and the present uh, regulation are concerned, to date, when determining the split, the committee has recommended to the commission one overall percentage by which all of the available monies in the fund would be split. Uh, and that split is presently set at 65% to the standard bred interest and 35% to the thoroughbreds. As of some point last year, it was actually 60-40, I believe, but then it was adjusted to 65-35. Uh, the commission adopted regulations that codify this statutory split process. And those are located at 205 CMR 149.04 paragraph 
four, and those are the ones that are before you here today. Those regulations direct that the distributions be conducted in accordance with the present uh, fashion and one overall percentage uh, be uh, established. Uh, I, I just pause at this point and note that I believe that the present approach is entirely appropriate. It's wholly consistent with the language of the statute. There's nothing wrong with it um, at all. However, with the benefit of experience um, and given the present circumstances that are confronted by the horse racing industry in general, the committee uh, has expressed an interest over the course of many uh, meetings and discussions um, in determining the distribution percentage in a similar but alternative method, which is also, in my opinion, consistent with section 60. So where the regulation only permits distribution in accordance with the present method, the, a modification of the regulations by the commission is required if this new approach is to be used. And so I'll, I'll get now uh, a little bit into what the new approach is versus the old approach. Um, unless there are any questions, we can uh, move into that. So under the, the new approach, instead of, again, determining one overall percentage by which all available funds will be split between the breeds, the committee would make individual split recommendations by categories. And recall by categories, I mean the purses, the breeding, and the health and welfare. The way I've looked at it, if this is helpful, is that we're essentially reversing the order of operations in crafting the split recommendation. Instead of determining the percentage of split between the breeds first, and then dividing the available monies in the fund into the three categories, we would be splitting the available monies in the fund up into the three statutory categories first, in accordance with the 80, 16, four percentages, and then determining the split percentage between the breeds within each category. So for example, there'd be one percentage for the purses, one percentage for breeding, and one percentage for the health and pension uh, benefits. And by untethering the individual categories from one another, the approach will afford the committee and ultimately the commission a greater ability to direct funds, in theory, uh, to the respective breeds based upon specific factors and established criteria with increased precision. And that's one of the other things that the committee looked at yesterday was what the criteria would be in applying um, each of these, uh, a split to each of the three categories. It's important to note, because this came up on a number of occasions as I discussed this proposal with folks from, uh, with different interests, uh, frankly, that the exact same number of actual dollars in the aggregate would be distributed within each of the three statutory categories. That is to say that 80% of all the money available in the fund would still go to purses, 16 will still go to the breeders programs, and 4% will still go to the health and pension benefits. However, the amounts distributed to a particular breed within a category may be adjusted based upon specific conditions that are considerations related to that category. So that's a kind of a backdrop as to the fund and the, the process that's used uh, to make the determinations. Um, I'd be happy to, to pause here uh, to address any questions. Uh, the next thing I, I wanted to get into otherwise was just the actual proposal, uh, or the actual regulation amendment. Questions, Commissioner Seneca? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a great, uh, I would also uh, add, uh, echo that uh, the, the way you lay out the, the issue in the memo is very well done, as you just did as well now with the summary done. Um, I, uh, I, I, it, this is a question slash comment uh, that, I, that, that might fall in the category of background, but my recollection is that when we issued the original regulation, again, which might be needed to be amended, uh, given, given what you just explained, my recollection is that there was, there was not a contemplation of these alternatives at the time. Um, we simply read the statute and, and as, as you know, the methodology that, we, that, that you just explained, uh, first the split and then you know, 
it flows to the different uh, funds. Um, so there was no um, point or counterpoint um, back then uh, until now uh, as to whether one method was better than the other. There was not a contemplation of any alternative methods. Uh, and I think that's an important background as we now ponder uh, the, the notion of maybe changing the regulation to accommodate the, the wishes of the committee. Commissioner, I think I, I can answer that best since I've been part of the committee um, since 2013. Um, you're absolutely right. There was the, both the committee and the commission at that time uh, never contemplated uh, another way of um, splitting those monies. And it's not until we've taken testimony and received written comments and uh, that we realize that changes could affect certain groups, in particular, health and, and, and pension benefits was a real issue. Those are folks um, who have been, um, you know, waiting for thoroughbred racing to come back and surviving on small amounts of money and other, other medical benefits that were afforded to them. So we did receive a lot of, the committee did, um, testimony, um, as well as written correspondence, comments, and the committee discussed these issues at length um, and said, well, is there another way to look at this? And um, Attorney Grossman was good enough to uh, listen to committee members and, and take a look and come back with, um, with a way of doing this differently. And um, the committee, uh, you know, we have been talking about it for months, but actually, uh, got a chance yesterday to uh, review the draft, review the needs of this industry, and does this make sense? And uh, there was a unan unanimous vote among the, among the committee members to move forward in this direction, um, as well as do it in an emergency fashion because people are hurting. And this was a way to have some um, some certainty, people would know what they'd be getting in each category and be able to plan accordingly and use those finances um, quickly. So that, that was the rationale. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Zuniga. It's, it's an important point to make. And that's why I always just like to point out that there's absolutely nothing wrong with the way it's been done up to this point. It, it is an obvious read of the statute to do it the way it's been done. Um, but when we took a, a closer look at it, and thanks to, uh, to Brian uh, for, for this, um, we saw that there was another way to do it too. And it's been my opinion and, and others as well that the statute uh, permits either approach. Um, and so that's, that's what brings us here ultimately today is because the regulation is written in such a way as it only allows, the way I read it, the, the first approach and not the second approach. And ultimately, in a nutshell, what the proposed amendments do is just allow for either approach. It doesn't say the commission or the committee have to do one or the other. And it just allows for either. And if I may, I'll just uh, kind of go into the, the could changes. I, yes. Could I, could I um, just uh, do, before you go into the, the um, particular changes, a couple broader questions? Unless um, my fellow commissioners, do you have questions? Just before we get into the actual language. Um, I, I did see the vote yesterday, and it's my understanding that all five members support this. I think Mr. Savage abstained. I'm not sure if I understood why he abstained. I think that he has um, an issue with an interpretation that was somewhat related, but he expressed his overall support on behalf of the Thoroughbred Association. So you do have the full support of, and I'm looking at both Commissioner Cameron and Chair Fitzgerald. I was going to correct myself, Madam Chair, when I was thinking about the vote. It was, it was for with one abstention, but support but because of another matter, decided not to uh, vote in the affirmative. But all of them voted support to support. Yeah. So we, ha we know that all have been heard. Um, <clears throat> two more questions then. Um, 
assuming this gets voted through and we are, you know, we really are just fixing our own regulation to actually reflect the statute because what we've done is we've limited the statute's application to this regulation. So it's, I feel it's important for us to uh, make this, this correction is really what it is. And I think you acknowledge as a technical correction, but I wanna make sure I understand the implications of, of um, what's happening. Are any of these funds shifting to an escrow account that were not in an escrow account before? No, this amendment, that's a, it's an excellent point and one that I definitely wanted to focus on and this is a great time to do it. Um, this amendment, these amendments would not shift any monies. They would not change the split. They wouldn't do anything along those lines. Okay. They simply, in my estimation, allow the committee to make a recommendation and then the commission ultimately to approve it uh, to change, to, to perform the split in a different way. Um, the escrow issue is, is a, a different issue. Um, it is embedded in these regulations, but we're not touching any of that language. Um, and that might be something you want to take up separately um, in the near future. Uh, but that is not being impacted at all by these amendments. Okay, um, and then when, assuming that this goes through and then the shift occurs, I understand that then within each of the three subcategories, there would be a decision with the, um, under uh, Chair Fitzgerald and Commissioner Cameron's roles and on the racing committee, there would be um, <clears throat> division of those subcategories. It then has to come to the commission, is that correct, Todd? And if it comes before us, do we actually have discretion or do we simply say, okay, that's approved, there's already been a proper process, you know, that we understand that fits the statute? <clears throat> Commissioner Cameron, did you want to respond to that? Um, well, oh, yes. I, I saw you. Uh, I thought you were leaning. No, no, no. In. If you wanted me to, I, no, I I'd be happy to I take it to. It's the leaning in thing. It's hard to read. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's certainly the latter. Meaning, um, there isn't a discretion to change, but there is if if something isn't done properly and or not fully explained. Certainly, the commission could send it back for more work. Um, something along those lines. If you want to uh, give a more legal definition. Uh, Attorney Grossman, go ahead. No, that was excellent, and I agree 100%. So the commission couldn't change the percentage or on its own initiative say we're, we're taking this up or we're changing the percentage or anything. It has to come from a recommendation by the committee. So as Commissioner Cameron said, if they sent you percentages and you felt that they weren't justified or that it wasn't clear how they reached those uh, decisions, you could send it back with instructions that they revisit something or you voice your discomfort with uh, whatever the decision was. And the committee could uh, take it up again. Recalling, of course, that there is at present a split in place. It's 65-35. So if it's not changed, that would just remain. Um, so, but to your point, uh, Madam Chair, it is really incumbent upon the committee in the first instance to make a recommendation uh, before the commission can really take any affirmative action. Thank you. Commissioner Sinega. Can I um, mention and, and, and ask a question? Um, just to clarify, um, well, I, I'm, I'm generally in favor of changing the, 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 the regulation. I think if we were writing it today, we should write it the way it is uh, written now with its modification to be more flexible to allow for either way. Um, but uh, um, I just want to recall a situation of a prior uh, recommendation. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting that's the case now, but I you recall that there was a change in the split that came one year, I forget exactly which one, but it was a retroactive um, recommendation which only meant it, we were able to deal with it, but only meant that certain flow of um, monies had to be suspended for a period of time in order to catch up with and make up for the actual uh, split. Is there anything in, um, 
in this regulation that now changes that or makes sure, or we, we, we just know from now, from then, that any kind of retroactive uh, recommendations would have to be dealt with during a period of time in order to be able to catch up. Um, I think I can jump in here as well. No, this does not contemplate any kind of a retroactive. This committee, we're a full, the reason we were forced to do that in the past is we, we did not have a full committee. Uh, in particular, we were um, on a couple of occasions, we lacked a chair and that we did not think that was fair to move forward with the work without a chair. Um, so we, and, and there were another member met, uh, missing at one point also. So we, um, we were forced to do our work later than we would have liked to, and thus the retroactive. Um, this committee, and the chair is, is on, um, really feel strongly about doing the work. We're a full committee doing the work in a timely manner. So we've worked really hard to, to get this um, done in advance of uh, racing. So there would be no need for uh, retroactive monies, which creates other problems. And, and again, they're, they're solvable. It just means that, you know, it well, yeah, but it, 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 isn't, it wasn't ideal. We recognized that. We were looking for fairness, um, but it, it did create other issues. So I, I know I'm encouraged that this committee is willing to work in a timely fashion and get this done. And uh, we have a plan to do that this year. And that, Commissioner Zuniga and commissioners, is, is really the driving force behind the emergency part of the request, is that given the uh, phase three designation, um, and of course it's ultimately uh, a matter that the commission will have to address, but um, the prospective opening in phase three of the racetrack, um, in order to get the updated splits in place, the committee would have to get started with its work reviewing the criteria and applying the criteria and get the recommendation. It has to go to the legislature for 30 days and then it has to come to the commission. So in order to get this all done, and we're moving very quickly, I think it's fair to acknowledge that we're moving way quicker than we ordinarily would with something like this. But I think if you're comfortable that we can do it responsibly. And I think the committee feels like it, it can do its part of its work responsibly this quickly. That that's really the driving force behind the emergency request is to avoid the retroactive piece of the puzzle. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of it. Uh, I think, um, um, as I mentioned, I think it's, it's, it's appropriate. I'm also in favor of doing it by emergency. Um, and I think there's an embedded notion in the statute relative to deference to the work of the committee. Um, I, I've attended uh, at least one recently of those uh, meetings and I've kept appraised of the developments um, uh, of that committee that, uh, that uh, Commissioner Cameron and, and, and many others uh, are also part of. So um, I'm quite comfortable moving forward. Yeah. Um. Madam Chair, just to jump in, I echo Commissioner Zuniga's comments um, and appreciate the work of the uh, of Chairman Fitzgerald and Commissioner Cameron. Um, I have never been a big fan of uh, the instances where we found ourselves uh, with the retroactivity piece. Um, I understand why, but uh, we understand that people were inostensibly hurt when we when we did that, so I'm, I'm happy to support moving this forward on an emergency basis. So we avoid that, and to Commissioner Cameron's point, try to help out some people that have been hurting in the process. Uh, Todd, I know that I think you wanted to maybe walk us through the actual changes. I don't know if um, my fellow commissioners feel that's necessary, um, although. If there's certain points you want to highlight, commissioners, would you like that, Commissioner O'Brien? Uh, I would. I would leave it to Todd's discretion. The discussion we just had, particularly on the emergent, the reason for the emergency request, um, clarified 
things for me, but Todd, I'd leave it to your discretion if you want to go into more detail. No, I think, I mean, we can, we can kind of leave it where it is if everyone's comfortable. Ultimately, I can represent to you the changes are, as I said, are just designed to allow the committee and the commission to uh, pursue the new approach. We were careful not to touch other stuff that at some point we may want to touch, but uh, we didn't want to go down that road for purposes of this process. Um, the I would just point out, as was was uh, referenced, there the committee itself did open this concept up to public comment in the industry. It was on uh, May 14th. Uh, where a number of stakeholders uh, commented on the comment, the notion of doing something like this, although most of their comments were related to adjusting the split uh, more so than changing the method. But um, it was something that was open um, uh, for public comment. Um, and, it, and also, I would just note that there are representatives of each of the breeds on the horse racing committee, as, as you're aware, as well. So I think you can comfortably do this. All of the interests are represented and did have an opportunity to look at this. And of course, as you well know, um, if there's anything in need of adjustment down the road, uh, there will be a formal process to follow. But um, I, I think I'm comfortable if you all are leaving it there for now. Excellent. So I think that this is um, up for a vote. Again, we thank uh, Chairman Fitzgerald for joining us today. Um, we have a, um, do we have a motion? Uh, to Matt, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the small business impact statement for 205 CMR 149.04 Racehorse Development Fund distributions escrow accounts as included in the commissioner's packet. Second. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes. Thank you. Five zero, Shara. Thank you. And uh, Madam Chair, if I may, I, I neglected to thank Shara as well, because Shara is a critical part of the Horse Racing Committee process as well. And I I'm, I'm apologize for not including you in the list of, of thank yous uh, earlier. But without her, I don't know that we ever would have gathered, been able to do any of this. So thank you to Shara as well for her role in this uh, effort. Thanks. We never forget Shara. <laughs> So thank you. And of course, Dr. Lightbound, I'm assuming that I haven't invited your comment, but I do see you occasionally nodding with approval. So I'm assuming that you're all set. Yes, and um, like Todd said, this um, allows the new form um, of doing the split, but it also, um, if the committee wanted, they could still do the old form as well. So it's not eliminating anything, it's just adding. Exactly, it's, and, it, and it is consistent with the statute. Yes. So we also have to vote on the proposed regulation itself. Do we have a motion? Uh, well, Madam Chair, I'll, um, I'll move that the commission approve the version um, of 205 CMR 205 uh, CMR 149.04 Racehorse Development Fund distributions, escrow accounts, uh, as included in the um, commission's packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any questions or edits, comments? We're good. Excellent. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. I vote yes. Thank you. So we're we're on our way uh, with respect to the emergency regulation, and wish uh, the horse racing committee uh, good good luck. And we will continue our process and keep both both groups informed. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks. Great work again, Todd. The uh, memo was really very very helpful. Great. Chairman Fitzgerald, be well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.
Does anybody need a break? It is 10 after 12 and it is um, we're on to item number seven. Did I see it? somebody would like a break? Okay. Yeah, I was um, just going to introduce the notion if we want to break for a little while or or for lunch. I don't know how much. Um, well, it is t 10 after 12. Um, <clears throat> I would uh, ask if we could have a, a, a short break because um, our schedules are uh, uh, expecting us to probably finish up. Okay. Um, I also think virtuals shouldn't extend too, too long. So um, how about a, a five minute break and, and resume our places so that everyone can stretch their legs? Yep. Does that sound good? Okay, yes. we, we will resume. Um, it is now 12-12, uh, 12-17. Please. Uh, Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, this, the corporate qualifier we have for you today is Keith Arlen Meister. He's a qualifier for MGM Springfield. Mr. Meister has submitted all of the required forms and complied with all of the IEB's requests for supplemental and updated information. The IEB conducted its complete protocol for suitability for casino qualifiers, and we confirmed financial stability, integrity, reviewed litigation history, searched criminal history, verified that no prohibited political contributions were made in Massachusetts, and conducted checks of open source and law enforcement databases as part of this background investigation. The team of investigators assigned to this background was Trooper David Collette of the Massachusetts State Police Gaming Enforcement Unit and financial investigator Matthew Jordan. IEB investigators were able to interview Mr. Meister on January 7, 2020 at 1 p.m. He was interviewed via teleconference from the Massachusetts Gaming Commission Investigations and Enforcement Bureau located at 101 Federal Street, 12th floor, Boston. The interview was conducted by the team previously mentioned, Trooper Collette and Mr. Jordan. Mr. Meister was cooperative and forthcoming in all aspects of the investigation. He joined MGM Resorts International, the parent company of Blue Tarp Redevelopment LLC and MGM Springfield, the Massachusetts Category 1 gaming licensee, in January of 2019 in the role of a non-executive independent director for MGM Resorts International. Mr. Meister is designated as a non-executive director because he is a member of the board of directors who is not in employment with the company, does not own any shares in the company, and does not have any monetary relationship with the company except his remuneration. Mr. Meister is based out of New York. In addition to his position as an independent director for MGM, Mr. Meister is the founder, managing partner, and CIO of Corvex Management, which is an investment firm he founded in 2010. Prior to founding Corvex, Mr. Meister held several overlapping within the ICON group of companies. Uh, these included working for ICON Enterprises, formerly known as American Real Estate Partners, as the president and CEO of that company from August of 2003 through August of 2010. He also worked for ICON Enterprises GP, which was formerly known as American Property Investors, incorporated from August of 2003 through March of 2006 as the president and CEO there. In addition, he worked for ICON Partners LP and ICON Partners Master Fund LP as a senior investment analyst for both companies from August of 2003 through August of 2010. In addition to his work at ICON, Mr. Meister also worked for High River Limited Partnership as a senior investment analyst from June of 2002 to August of 2010. And again, worked for ICON Associates Corp from June 2002 to August 2010. He was a senior investment analyst and managing director there. And as you'll see, there are overlapping dates of employment due to his differing roles, differing parts of the ICON group of companies. Uh, Mr. Meister also worked for JNet Ventures as a president from March of 2000 to August of 2001, and for North Star Capital Investments Group from September of 1997 to January 2000. He was an investment analyst at North Star. Our background review confirmed that Mr. Meister completed his undergraduate studies at Harvard College in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1995, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in government. Mr. Meister is licensed in good standing through the Indiana Gaming Commission, the Louisiana State Police, the Mississippi Gaming Commission, and the Nevada Gaming Control Board. 
Mr. Meister has demonstrated to the IEB by clear and convincing evidence that he is suitable and the IEB recommends that the commission vote to find him suitable as a qualifier for MPM. Thank you. Questions for Kate. Kate, thorough, thorough report, um, both uh, today's and your written report. So thank you. Um, questions that did I see, Gail, Commissioner Cameron, did you? No, no questions, very clean report. Very clean, uh, both the investigation and the individual. Very, very well done and uh, no issues at all. Well, thank you very much. And I'll make sure to pass those compliments on to the team. Uh, they did uh, the lion's share of the work here, Trooper Collette and uh, Mr. Jordan from the FI team. They were both doing their best to join on the call. Uh, so thank you very much. And they may well be on again. I don't see, all, I can't know all the numbers. So thank you. Uh, just remind me the number of uh, licenses he already holds. So he is currently licensed by four um, other um, agencies that we would recognize as being in good standing. Questions for Kate? It's nice to see, see you. In it's lovely to see case. you all too. So thank you. Um, you do need a vote today. Yes, please. Do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move that the Commission find Keith Arlen Meister, non-executive independent director for MGM Resorts International, suitable as a qualifier for Blue Tarp Redevelopment, LLC. Second. So, thank you. Any, any further questions, comments? Are none. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. Thank you. And Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. Can I vote? Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kate. Thank you all. Take care. Be well. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. Moving on now to um, item number eight. Um, Derek Lennon is our Chief Financial and Accounting Officer and he always comes with his team and always acknowledges that all the work that he doesn't do is all the work of all of his team. And he always claims that it's always all of their work. Um, we know better. Um, we thank Derek for his leadership and um, I know Commissioner Zuniga, you're also going to comment on, the, on our uh, budget discussion and we have um, Agnes um, Leo is here. Thank you. It's nice to see you, Agnes. And then uh, we also have uh, Doug um, O'Donnell should be joining us. There he is, Revenue uh, Manager Agnes, of course, our Finance and Budget Manager. And Derek will have you kick it off as our, our Chief Financial and Accounting Officer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioners, for having us today. Um, we look forward to giving you this update. We wish we could give you our normal package of documentation. Um, however, we this is a abnormal year as far as um, operations go. And I do want to once again say thank you to everyone, not just my team, but the whole uh, commission. Everyone has been helpful in this. Um, Commissioner Zuniga is going to give us the highlights because he really has been um, key in this process. So um, I think he has some talking points he wants to get to as far as where we are in the process, how we got here, and then we're all available for questions and answers. But this really has been a great, um, a collaborative effort to get to where we are. And that is not just internally, but um, our licensees gave us some great feedback last week. And um, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Zun again now. Just one point. I know that interim executive director Wells has been involved. Yes. Um, every step of the way. Yes, um, Karen yes. has been Karen has been knee deep in this every step of the way. She immersed herself. She's been, uh, you know, taking on a lot of the difficult conversations, both internally and externally. So um, her her effort in this goes um, should not go unnoticed. And I and I just acknowledge Derek. You really have been leading this effort uh, throughout having to deal with so many external and internal stakeholders and discussions and questions. So I, I personally appreciate all the patients and I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of all my fellow commissioners. So thank you for looking forward to today's discussion and the discussions that we know are scheduled for the future. So Commissioner Zunica. 
Yes, uh, thank you, uh, everybody. Um, thank you, Derek, Karen, and Chair, and everybody. Um, let me just mention that we are generally adhering to the regular uh, schedule that we would have had. We're slightly delayed uh, because of all the unusual circumstances that we all know very well. Um, we will uh, we will talk today a little bit about the rough strokes of the draft budget that will be coming. Um, a future shortly in the short term future meeting to vote on. Um, we anticipate that um, uh, you know uh, Derek uh, like um, like in the past will distribute uh, materials, um, spreadsheets, reports, um, and have an opportunity to update uh, uh, commissioners individually on some of the things uh, and some of the details and comparisons to last year. But let me uh, just give you an overview of where we are generally, and um, and then you know take uh, questions or ask uh, the rest of the team to expound on, on when they think on where they think that I should. Um, and I'm sorry that there's I'm going to be speaking to numbers uh, and some of us be more visual, but uh, bear with me and uh, and I'll try to just rise round numbers. Um, for fiscal year 20th, uh, the, the, the year that is ending at the end of this month, we had a $28.4 million figure in terms of regulatory costs, uh, $2 million of indirect costs, $3.6 million uh, uh, that would go to the Office of the Attorney General, and 75,000 that would flow to the ABCC for a total of 34 million, uh, 135,000 um, of, uh, of, of that budget. To that, we should add a $5 million assessment of the Public Health Trust Fund, uh, which I will speak to separately. And that would be the total, that was the total assessment anticipated at the beginning of the year, and as we have gone through um, um, through the quarters on the licensees, now that uh, figure is generally coming down uh, to 33.77 million, uh, plus the five million dollar assessment of the public health trust fund, through a series of efforts, some of which we have already discussed uh, in prior meetings in trying to contain some costs um, that, uh, that uh, given the, the recent circumstances. We've uh, eliminated travel. We have done a number of things uh, relative to uh, 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 parking and uh, et cetera. And so we are projecting that we'll bring that uh, original budget down from originally anticipated. Um, in the case of the research and responsible gaming figure, uh, something similar is, is happening. We, even though we make an assessment of $5 million um, to the licensees as it's required by statute, we take out of that fund by virtue of the MOU that we have with, uh, with EPH. This year we did uh, 6.5 million uh, to run the programs uh, like GameSense, the research uh, uh, paid for some other costs associated with that uh, area. And that overall number uh, is projected to go down to 6.28 million at the, before the end of this, uh, of this year. Again, this, is, this has to be uh, understood in the context of that's not the actual cost to licensees because the difference between the 6.2 and, and the $5 million assessment is effectively bringing, coming in from the taxes and gaming revenues that some of which flow to the public health trust fund. Um, so as we started this uh, process, uh, the, the process for budgeting for fiscal year 21, uh, we were contemplating uh, what Derek calls a ma ma you know, maintenance budget, which I think is appropriate, uh, of slightly higher than the prior budget of 35.25 million. Um, 
there are, uh, uh, I'm not going to get into the details of some of these, um, uh, what was driving some of the growth. So let's just say some of it was natural, some of it was anticipated. Um, and we are now in an environment where we uh, have heard from licensees, uh, understand the reality around us, and have made efforts to try to contain the growth and even reduce uh, the burden of our overall uh, budget. Now, uh, it, it's important to remember that that figure, when it's totaled, um, a regulatory cost, indirect, attorney general's office, and ABCC, we can only control only so much of those costs. Uh, even within the regulatory costs, which are ultimately what we do control, there's a lot of fixed costs that we should talk about uh, uh, at some point, or at least understand uh, conceptually. So um, through efforts, again, some in recent uh, in a recent meeting, uh, but all, but some of them also ongoing, uh, we are uh, bringing down that uh, figure to, or we started uh, internally to bring that 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 figure to 34 million. Um, that meant uh, you know no build, building no races, uh, not no backfilling of certain positions. Um, reduction of travel, uh, uh, reduction in some development of the licensing management system, uh, a reduction in some of the grant funding, and, uh, and directing a portion of the salaries of the employees working of, on communication fund uh, to that fund, like we do in other uh, funds, the Public Health Trust Fund, for example. So uh, with that budget, uh, we we had a meeting recently with uh, licensees, a virtual meeting. Um, you know, they have been in person in the past, um, and uh, there's a request um, for us to continue to consider the the cash flow, um, the, the the old negative cash flow um, that budgets like this, which they understand and they will pay uh, as as it's required. But they, they request consideration to continue looking at uh, mitigating uh, costs where, uh, where appropriate. And, and, and let me just sort of make a small parenthesis there in, in, that, in that request. It's, it's not only the amount, uh, there's also a request in considering of, on, on timing, uh, because also cash flow is very uh, much something that they are looking at on a, you know, really on a daily basis. Um, and there's a third and important uh, request uh, uh, as well, and that is the burden that we place on, on them uh, when we conduct the job that we do uh, um, under normal circumstances. Um, that is not necessarily a budgetary item, but that's something that really came through as part of these, uh, these discussions. Where we can be flexible, uh, I think we should really, uh, in terms of uh, things that they have to submit, they have to do, um, they are operating on their, um, you know, really a skeleton crew in some cases um, to try to keep uh, their, their cash flow um, optimal. So um, those additional uh, reductions uh, in, in, in um, as I'm highlighting them that come from those conversations are, uh, you know, reducing some of the overtime uh, originally anticipated for, for the state police. Um, building um, a more turnover savings um, for the gaming control fund, um, reducing some of um, what the attorney general's office might be um, considering from the fiscal year 20th, and um, essentially not backfilling the majority of the vacant positions. Uh, now, I should say that. Um, if we if we do that, we would we would be generally in the thirty two point three million dollar overall figure. Um, now, as I mentioned, you will have the benefit of a spreadsheet, a report, and a discussion with Derek um, on, on on these details. But I at least wanted to um, to to give this overview. Uh, let me also mention uh, something else relative to the public health. Uh, trust fund, because the 36, uh, uh, 
I'm sorry, the 32 figure does not in, in include that. Um, I, as you know, I'm part. Uh, I'm the designated co-chair of that um, of that uh, committee. Um, we are also contemplating a reduction in funding by virtue of the majority of the money that flows to that fund uh, would have come from gaming taxes, and that is something that is greatly diminished by uh, by the suspension of operations of the casino, the temporary suspension, and. Uh, we are uh, contemplating a budget for the for the Massachusetts for the Gaming Commission's portion of 4.6 million. So you remember I gave you a figure of uh, 6.5 that was coming down at the end of this year to 6.2. Uh, We're taking that down uh, for the next fiscal year, and that has already been approved by that uh, committee down to 4.6. That includes um, important cuts uh, to the Game Sense program and research, uh, but not to the point where we think we're obliterating the programs because we are assuming that they will, uh, they will come back um, once uh, the casinos can operate. Um, as part of that projection, we are assuming that we would uh, defer the assessment of one quarter of the five million dollar amount by at least one 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 quarter, um, but we're able to manage that uh, by virtue of the balance that currently sits with the gaming uh, with the public health trust fund, and again the reduced amounts that both DPH and the MGC are gonna. Um, are going to um, operate under the next year. So um, that's the general overview. Uh, there, there is something else uh, that uh, that has come up um, that that I should highlight, and that is that the statute talks about and our regulations talk about a six hundred dollar per machine uh, fee that is imposed on gaming licensees. Um, as of July 1. And uh, whenever the machine number changes, there would be a proration that would have to be done uh, accordingly. Um, now, licensees have asked that whether this fee would be payable, um, and uh, depending on whether the situation stands as of July 1, um, and it's perhaps it suffice to say that even if it's not uh, on July 1 and, it, uh, and, and operations uh, begin later, there will still be a prorated amount. Um, I still would like to point out that any relief um, in, in terms of this fee um, really results in the balance being assessed back on licensees. Um, and in my opinion, there's not much of a difference. But it's something that, again, they um, they have asked. It's a topic for discussion that we should all understand. Um, and it's essentially upcoming because uh, July 1 will be here soon. So that's, uh, that's the overview. Um, again, I'm sorry there's no numbers in front of you so that you can go through them. Uh, there will be, and, and, and I will not be part of that uh, briefing. Um, Derek will uh, with with you either individually or at two at a time, um, and we'll have a lot of those uh, reports and details for a much uh, much uh, healthier discussion if needed at a, at a soon upcoming commission meeting. I can take questions or um, ask um, commissioners or or staff. To, um, to uh, yeah, Enrique, I had one question about um, the AGO, the line item for the AGO's office. Have you had conversations with the AGO, or is that a projection based on the shutdown? It's, uh, we, we've had uh, very brief discussions, uh, not me personally, but uh, uh, Derek, Agnes, um, relative to the next year. Um, they're, uh, given the, the current spending, I think it's safe for us to say that you know we, you know the the, the figure that I just mentioned, 
um, maybe some $250,000 reduction for this year is, is very doable because they have not encumbered and it's unlikely that in this one month that's remaining will encumber so much uh, relative to their spending. But it's, by the way, it's not unusual that any agency comes with late encumbrances and, and catches up towards the end of the fiscal year. But we're comfortable that uh, that, that will be uh, just fine. But uh, um, I have, we have not had any more detailed discussions than that. I, maybe I should mention that um, there's uh, there's a statutory limit on the on the um, on the amount that they um, they can charge back uh, uh, to us and and, and we pay uh, you know through the licensees of course um, and uh, and that excludes the state police uh, portion that's assigned to their office um, but taking into account all of those uh, moving pieces uh, we're comfortable with the way you know, it's it's playing out. Okay, thanks. Other questions for uh, Derek and Enrique and team? So this is just the beginning of the discussion and, and the details will follow. Um, I've had the benefit of being part of many of these discussions. Again, I, I mentioned uh, Derek's leadership. He's also been speaking with external stakeholders that includes our state partners, um, our licensees, keeping all of us informed, all of the, all of um, Karen's team, all the directors have been working extensively on looking at their, their piece, see how they can be helpful at these extraordinary times. So everybody really has, has played a part. Um, and I appreciate the licensees uh, meeting and, you know, so far it's been a very, very thorough and uh, helpful process. I also have to commend Commissioner Zuniga for his leadership in the Public Health Trust Fund. He um, navigates um, that commission, uh, which is a, a committee that has formed through an MOU uh, with the Department of um, Public Health, which is under the leadership of Health and Human Services. And we very much appreciate that relationship. And uh, Commissioner Zuniga has done a great job navigating that um, budgetary process, which is no easy feat, but he's kept his eyes on what's important uh, in our programs that um, Mark Vanderlinden leads in terms of the public health outreach with Teresa's good assistance, great assistance, um, uh, affects the lives of so many who face a problem gambling or need support to be a responsible gambler. So, uh, so and, and, and with, you, with your help, that has also been possible, uh, Chair. I, let me just mention that um, we had on, on that group, um, under normal circumstances, uh, you know, some healthy tensions relative to allocation of resources. Suffice to say, with a greatly diminished uh, budget, uh, those those are that much more uh, challenging. Right, but Commissioner Zuniga has navigated it very, very well, and it's a it's a big piece of the puzzle here. So we thank you, um, and and again, also, uh, Todd, you've been a great resource for this as well. But Derek, thank you. Um, any other questions on the details? And what is your timing on the um, for the next steps, Derek? Can you remind us? Yes, we'll have our traditional uh, presentation to you at the next commission meeting. Um, let you absorb that, ask any questions, put it off for public comment for two weeks, um, and then we'll ask you to vote at the following meeting. So that would be the June 18th. We are contemplating another public um, meeting, maybe on the 11th. So on the 18th, we should get your first full report, then it will go out for public comment. And in between that time, we'll have the two by twos. So we'll give you two by twos on the before the meeting on the 18th, so that you can be prepared to ask any detailed questions. Um, we won't revise the documents until after that, until um, after that meeting when you have your detailed questions. Um, and one thing I do, you know, I'll be covering in the two by twos is the shift um, of putting some salaries to the community mitigation fund. 
Um, it is really just people directly working on it. And then there's another discussion about whether we should shift any admin salaries. Um, like we're trying to, I think we're shifting away from that, but um, you know, there is a cost allocation plan behind it. The same thing we did with racing when we shifted salaries off to that area. Um, and um, you know, the other point to, to really address on the uh, attorney general's um, piece is we do pay their actual costs. So our budget uh, up to 3 million, our budget doesn't really matter if they exceed what our budget is, we pay the, we pay the actual cost. So this is just one of those ones of the licensees saying, hey, can we, can we cut back a little bit? We understand if the costs come in, we'll have to pay it. But if they don't, can we cut back so that our assessment is a little lower? Yeah, and as you, um, those are good points. And as you um, look at and begin to have these uh, discussions with Derek, um, I'm sure you, you'll, you'll notice that um, anything further from the figures I, I outlined require some, uh, some other type of discussion. Um, and, and, and that's when I, what I mean by fixed costs. We have, you'll, you'll see, it's not a surprise to anybody, that uh, some of the large, the largest uh, portion of our costs are salaries. Um, the uh, the subsequent two line items um, uh, of, of of our budget are uh, our rent and our central monitoring system, and those are long term contracts uh, that have uh, very huge implications into how, if at all, we can we can modify. Uh, they're, they're not, uh, it's not out of the realm to, to modify. And those are things that I believe we need to explore. Um, I, I actually, uh, I, uh, you may have, um, uh, someone mentioned that, you know, if we, if we wanted to have a discussion relative to our, our rent, our lease, that's even something that we might be able to do in an executive session. Um, but uh, the current, and whether we do that or not, uh, the current situation of, uh, uh, you know, the next few months perhaps still uh, being one in which we uh, operate in remote fashion in some way um, might be an important uh, occasion uh, to really now look at, uh, uh, at that, and that type of cost. So, um, again, you'll have the benefit of a lot more detail uh, than this. Um, but I can still take questions if, if, um, if there are. Any questions? I don't see any fellow commissioner leaning in at this point. I think we're looking forward to having the two by twos. Um, I think you decided that two by twos would be most effective rather than a, a single silent meeting, but you know, that's another tool for you to consider if you, if you decide. And then we'll, um, for us to be better informed uh, for the 18th, we're looking forward to the full discussion. In terms of the um, the rent, uh, perhaps on on the 18th too, we can have Derek comment on DCAM's position with respect to all agencies that are in our position where we have um, obligations on um, <clears throat> on with respect to rent while we're working remotely. That'd be really helpful. Agnes, do you have anything to add? No, I don't. I'm, I'm perfectly happy here. <laughs> good, good. Well, we look forward to hearing the report from you on the 18th. And Doug? Uh, no, we are good on this end. Um, just looking forward to next year and see what that brings. That's great. Well, be safe, both of you. Derek, would you like to close out? Just want to say thank you to everyone again. Um, thank you to the whole team, Commissioner Zuniga. Uh, Karen Wells, Todd, Agnes, Doug, everyone that's been involved, um, your patience with us, Chair, through this process. Um, I know it's been a very difficult year for everyone. We started this in a pretty good um, economy in January, and you know, just the way staff and our licensees have been working through this with us is very appreciative, um, and, and it's appreciated by, by all involved. Um, so thank you, and I look forward to having the conversation on the 18th. Excellent. Yeah, let, let me just add my thanks to everybody. Uh, uh, Derek, Doug, Agnes, Jay, um, Jacqueline, 
um, Karen, of course. Um, operating, uh, you know, virtually uh, required, you know, for the finance team required uh, some some changes and at times back-to-back -back meetings and and a lot of um, uh, virtual signatures. But they're doing a great job, um, and, uh, and and I think uh, they'll continue to do that. Thank you. All right, then we'll move on to our last item, Commissioner's Update. Uh, I, I reserve time for if you want to provide any further thoughts on our current state, or if you have an update on any of the work that you're engaged on in. Today we had the um, excellent report from Commissioners Cameron and O'Brien on the sexual harassment policy, which we appreciate. Thank you so much. Commissioner Zuniga for all your work. Thank you on the budget. And then of course we heard too from Jill Griffin and I know Commissioner Stebbins is so involved with respect to our minority vendors. Um, when I say ours, it's casinos, but we um, work very closely with them and admire Jill's leadership. So all of you have um, made a big difference every, you make a big difference every day, regardless of whether we're together in an office or working remotely, so thank you. Commissioner's update. Mr. Cameron? I'm all set, thank you very much. I got a chance to say a few things earlier, so I am fine, thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner O'Brien? No, I, I think I addressed it when we did the reg hearing, so thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Zinnica? No, thank you very much, everybody. Commissioner Stebbins? Nothing to add, just wishing everybody the best and stay safe and healthy. With that, thank you. I need a motion to adjourn, please. So motion move. to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Lunchtime. All righty. Roll call. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. Thank you, everybody. And I vote yes. Thank you. 5-0. Everyone be safe. Appreciate everyone. Thank you.